please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Just for the folks at home, the folks in the crowd, just our casual appearance. I just want to make sure everyone knows this is our summer attire. This is something we do after Memorial Day, and we'll do this right up till the time the kids go back to school. So uh, hopefully you'll won't complain about too much when I wear shorts and hair, and you see my white legs and all. <laughs> okay. First thing on the agenda, we want to go over the, and sign the State House bans for water and wastewater. So I'd like to turn it over to the town administrator, quickly review it, and we'll get that done. Sir, I believe Maureen's here for that. Marianne. Marianne, I'm sorry, Marianne's here for that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the uh, board being flexible with the schedule this evening and the town treasurer for joining us as well. Uh, so this is an authorization for short-term borrowing for um, the work that was approved at the October 2017 town meeting to evaluate the Andover water and wastewater alternative. Uh, we went through, we did our most recent uh, round of uh, bonding. We did not include that in the short term borrowing. It needs to be borrowed for in the fiscal year in which the expenses took place, the first fiscal year, which is fiscal year 2018, the current year that we're in. An option that was available to us to address this was a state house bond um, program, which Marianne has worked with our financial advisors, uh, the uh, bonds were sold, I believe, on Friday. And uh, we have a motion that's in the packet, if I recall correctly. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward motion. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there's some documents to be signed. Yes. Um, so it's a short-term borrowing. Um, I don't know if there's any detail you can offer on the sale from um, <coughs> Monday, um, Friday. If you could speak right in the microphone, that would be great as well. So um, the bonds, the bands will be actually going to be due on the same time as the bands that we have outstanding that we do the 14th of June of 2019. Um, Century Bank won the bid, and it was for 2.45 percent. One. Century Bank. Um, 2.45 percent, and we'll we will receive the money on June 28th, 2018. That's for 325 thousand dollars yeah, so we're going to pull it forward. That's right, most of the time. Yes. Questions, anyone? Michael, you have anything else? Nope, we have prepared a, a very simple motion that would effectively is authorizing the board members to sign the document. Mr. O'Leary, I'll take a motion if no one else has any questions. Sure. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve and sign State House notes for borrowing for water, wastewater study and design as approved in Article 10, October 2nd, 2017, town meeting. Second. I have a second by Mrs. Manupelli. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. We have documents to be signed <coughs> here. So we have to sign this before you leave, right there. Please. There's only a few.
All right, Mary Ann, you want these things here? Yes, Do you want to make sure? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? We're good? Thank you. Thank you for staying. No problem. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is the proclamation. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, we're pleased to be able to uh, recognize um, a resident here in town who's turning um, 100 uh, next week. Uh, there'll be a celebration uh, for a birthday or birthday party, I guess, if you will, um, next Wednesday at the Senior Center uh, in conjunction with Bingo, if I understand it correctly. Um, so uh, working with the Elder Affairs Director, Ms. Prenny, uh, we're asking the board to approve a proclamation accordingly that is to be presented to um, the uh, individual at the event next Wednesday at 1 o'clock. With that being said, Mr. Chairman, I move to proclaim June 25th, 2018, Carmela Milly Castiglione Casiccio Day and to read the attached proclamation. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? Uh, shall I read the... Uh, Please. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Proclamation. Whereas Carmela Millie Castiglione Casiccio was born June 25th, 1918 in the West End of Boston, one of eight children. And whereas Millie worked for Intercity Home Care, taking care of seniors until she was 80 years old, receiving the Silver Service Award for her work. In 2017, Millie was the guest speaker at Mystic Valley Elder Services annual legislative breakfast which she spoke of being a home care provider to now being a recipient of home care. And whereas Millie has lived in North Reading for over 15 years and has been a vibrant mem member of the community, including particip participating in many senior c center activities, particularly her favorite activity, bingo. Now therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of North Reading, do hereby proclaim June 25th 2018 Carmela Millie Castiglione Casiccio Day and urge all citizens of North Reading to join us in wishing Millie a happy 100th birthday. Wonderful. Now we have the motion and the second. Anybody like to say anything? Happy birthday. Congratulations. Happy <laughs> birthday. Congratulations. That's fantastic. fantastic. Mm -hmm. If the members of the board would please sign. So I will. Um, at this time, it's, it works on my schedule that I will be there to present it, uh, and I will sing her happy birthday. All right. Oh, God. Oh. By myself, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, and well, I hope she's not impaired in any yeah, way. If anything, I hope her hearing is somewhat I'm impaired. I'm going to sing it in Italian. Yeah. <laughs> you going to sing it in Italian? <laughs> oh, all right. West End of Boston, definitely. Well, the West End of Boston, there's not much of it left. So I have a motion to second. <coughs> any other discussion? If none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. West End's on the MGH. Okay. West End. No. Next, we're going to vote to accept the gift station. from Amazon yeah, okay. to the fire department. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, through you, I've asked the fire chief to be here this evening um, because uh, the department has uh, been the recipient of a gift from uh, one of the businesses here in town, uh, Amazon, uh, over at River Park Drive off of Concord Street. Um, they've stepped forward to offer us uh, uh, basically a cash donation or check donation if you will uh, to be used for equipment in the fire department and with that I'm going to turn it over to Fire Chief Don Stats to give the board an update and present the check to you Mr. Chairman. Okay well I'd like to uh, publicly thank Amazon Robotics for stepping up uh, a little background on this. Amazon uh, had approached us a while back to offering to do something for us uh, after putting our heads together Deputy Galvin and Captain Pepper and I we are in the market for purchasing new battery-powered hydraulic tools. And we put a proposal together hoping that Amazon would select a portion of the proposal to fund. Uh, we submitted that to them, asking them that exactly, and they came back and decided to fund the entire proposal. So in the tune of $36,569. So a very generous donation to the fire department. And Again, I would like to thank the coordination and teamwork that Deputy Galvin and Captain Pepper provided, uh, along with myself and Amazon, in bringing this to fruition. They unfortunately couldn't be here today, but they wish they could. So I'd like to present this check to the town. Well, I would like to get a motion first, if I could, before we take the check. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I move to accept a gift 
for the North Reading Fire Department from Amazon Inc. in the amount of $36,569 for the Fire Department Engine Tools. Second. I have a motion and second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? Mr. O'Leary. This is certainly greatly appreciated, but Chief, if you could expound a little bit as to what these tools do and how sure. they can help not just you know, manufacturing or, or Amazon, but yeah, other absolutely. Uh, people the, in the community? These are, these are basically the Jaws of Life tools that we've used for many years uh, operating out of a, a power head that is mounted in the truck. Uh, with new technology and the, uh, the newer advancements of battery technology specifically, we moved to a battery operated uh, JAWS tool uh, in our last purchase, uh, engine purchase. And they've performed flawlessly, uh, no lack of power. Uh, they do everything in the portability is second to none where we can carry them into facilities like Amazon if a worker became trapped um, could just be as hand trapped in, in between rollers and we have the ability to now bring those tools in <coughs> easily and, and, and uh, free them. Uh, not only that, we've used them successfully in the woods uh, lifting heavy objects off of a trap worker, uh, a landscape worker, and they're, they're very good tools. So uh, we're very happy that Amazon provided this funding and relieved the town some some stress financially. Great. Well, I'd, I'd like to just say thank you to Amazon. You know, they continue to have this commitment to the community. We can't thank them enough. We feel like we have a great relation with them, and we look forward to continuing. And we thank them for this donation. We, we know it will save people's lives, and uh, it certainly helps us in these days where you know, our budgets are getting tighter. So they certainly have helped us yeah, in a lot of ways. That goes a long way. So if there's anybody else that has anything else to say? Yeah, just a letter of correspondence and thanks from the board, the that administration. Would uh, yeah. That would be great if you could put that together, Michael, and I'll sign it. Sure. We will certainly do that. So, any other discussion? If none, all those in oh, Thank sorry. you. Thank you to you yeah. and Deputy Chief Galvin and Captain Pepper, too, for coordinating yeah. that. That's I'll great. Pass that along. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Unanimous. Public comment. Anyone here for public comment? <coughs> Selectman's report. Oh, you're Phil. Phil. Oh, sorry. Whatever you like. Thank you you got to switch the camera over to yourself, though, I Phil. Know, I'm <laughs> yeah, really? I know enough this to keep it off. This is not right, Phil. Yeah. Phil, this is Just not right. right. Will you please get over there no, and no, operate no, the no, camera? No. You, you, <laughs> Phil, you've got to put it on yourself. I yeah. try. You know, I'm not. I'm behind the camera guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, thank you for letting me speak of Phil Healy, uh, 110 Lowell Road, uh, North Reading. I'm actually here uh, to talk about a program at the Flint Moore Library that we. Uh, this is the second screening we're doing. It's uh, the third Thursday or third Tuesday of every month, and it's called Cinematic Conversations. And we host uh, pretty much a screening, a free screening to the public. Uh, and we have a Boston area critic come and lead a discussion on it uh, beforehand and after. And so tomorrow night, Tuesday, at the Flint Moore Library in the community room, I believe it's its basement, but they don't like calling it a basement, which I understand. <laughs> it is, uh, the movie will be The Man Who Wasn't There, the Coen Brothers film from uh, 2001. So it's free, and anyone wants to come, it's at 7 p.m. And we have Boston area critic uh, Adam Lovett speaking in front of it and leading the discussion after. So if anyone's interested, it's free. Go for it, and we'll have many more to come. So thank you. Any other public comment? Selectman report. Does anyone have anything for a selectman report? How about we'll leave, we'll leave it until we hear from Andover, or at least <laughs> ours, mine. <laughs> Mr. Schultz? Yeah, I just wanted to congratulate all the new graduates. We had a recent graduating class in North Reading High School and also some of the other schools in the area, and wish the, those young guys and, and women nothing but the best, and this is the best summer you're going to have in your life, so enjoy it, and be safe out there. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Girls softball. Yes, I guess. Uh, yeah. Girls softball is semifinal, 23 and 0, going to the semifinals. What day is Thursday. today? Thursday in Taunton. Yeah. But fan Tuesday. Tuesday, I think it's tomorrow. Against the Division tomorrow. Two team. But it's unbelievable. Fan. Fantastic. But I think they're gonna win. I, I hope they're going to win. This is great. They're going to go to the, I think the defending champs. Yeah. They're going against the greater nice to have a new greater sign in town. It'd be nice to have a new sign in town. Absolutely. <laughs> but congratulations <laughs> yeah. to them. 23 and 0. That's outstanding. Outstanding. 
Mr. Messier. Amazing. Well, school is ending and the kids will be out on the streets on their bicycles. And I just caution everybody in town to uh, pay attention to them. We don't have any accidents and we have a safe summer. Mr. Minnie Pelly. Just one quick thank you to the uh, middle school administration, all the parent chaperones who took all those kids to Washington, D.C., and and also to the ones that took care of the kids that were that decided to stay behind and do all the day trips. Thank you. Um, successful eighth grade trip. Had a lot of fun, I guess, and and thank you in no small part to those people who organized it and kept everything in order, everyone in order. So I have a few things, but I'm going to keep those for older new business. But I do have one thing I want to make sure people know that on July 30th, there's a tobacco bylaw public hearing, and I really think we need to make sure we publicize it. Even at our next meeting on the 23rd, we need to go out of our way to make sure the public's aware that this public hearing is going to take place. We need to get the information of the where and the time, because I don't have those with me. But I think it's important because the town is facing another challenge. Not only are drugs becoming uh, obviously a continued issue for the town, but the tobacco issue is increasingly becoming a problem, especially in this vaping. It's getting to a point now where it's an epidemic, and the kids are doing it in our schools. They're doing it everywhere, and we need to get some kind of controls in what we allow our vendors here in our uh, stores to be able to sell it and what they're selling. Uh, and I think the chief will be at that public hearing and be able to give a little more insight. I'm not sure, Michael, if you're... Yeah. Where you is it any? going to be? I don't have the, the time of the date. I just know... It's on July 30th. I, I'm sorry I don't have I was just looking for it. Mm -hmm. But I believe it's here in this room at 7 o'clock. I'm almost certain of it. So I, I don't have the details in front of me, but um, you know, I, I know that the Board of Health has been working um, closely to try to uh, improve upon the regulation here in town relative to uh, the sale of tobacco products, particularly with some of the uh, so-called loopholes that exist out there with the emergence of the, uh, the technology and the types of, of use. But uh, we'll, we can have a full report available on the 23rd. To brief and, people. and it would be great. I know the board's busy, and I know you go to a lot of meetings. But I think if, if several of us could show up for that evening to show support for this, I think it's important because it is something that's going to impact our community greatly if we don't get behind it. And I will give a lot of credit to Mr. Bracey and, uh, and to Mrs. Um, Leckowitz. She's, they've been doing a great job. They're fighting a major battle here, and we need to give them our support. So the rest of my comments I can say for all the new business. All right. Next meet with the housing production plan consultant and vote and accept the affordable housing plan. Mr. Chairman, through you, as uh, uh, the town planner approaches, uh, we, as I think the board is well aware at this point, we've, the planning commission has been working on the uh, state required housing production plan uh, for the better part of the past year, if I remember correctly. And um, there we're, we're graced with the presence of the consultant who's helped them here this evening as well, which the town planner will introduce. Um, so. As she brings up this presentation, I think that the desire here is to kind of conclude the public review and obtain approval from the board so that we can conclude that process um, and, um, and move forward with that plan, as I understand it, advising our master planning effort, which is really going to be ramping up this year. Okay. And with that, I will turn it over to the town planner. Do you need any help with the um, I just want to make sure what's on the screen gets to what's on. The projection. Yeah, So we did confirm it's seven o'clock that uh, public hearing for the tobacco is seven o'clock in this room on July thirtieth. Do you know how to make it <laughs> up here? <laughs> I have it up here. One second, don't I'm gonna do my best, but Steve. The water and wastewater, do you want to wait on that till later? Or do you want to go to that next? Timing's everything. I know, that's right. Yeah, so we, we, can, push we it, can push it off. We can push it off if we don't hear.
Mike, will you need a few more minutes? Do you mind if we go to some minutes while you're doing that? Go right ahead. Mr. Leary, would I throw a little curveball at you? We can maybe run through some minutes while Michael's trying to get the technology Well, let's just see what we have here. All right. So we're going to go to the minutes of May 21st, 2008, regular session and executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve May 21st, 2018, open session minutes as written. Second. A motion by Mr. O'Leary, second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the May 21st, 2018 executive session minutes as written. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the May 30th open session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. June 4th. There we go. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the June 4th, 2018 open session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the June 4th, 2018 town meeting minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? Uh, just a little bit more cryptic because the town administrator handled it, but they're, they're adequate. <laughs> they're ad yeah, they're adequate. <laughs> they're not, yeah. they're not Jane Brooks-like. Yeah, no, they're, but they're adequate. They're close. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. <laughs> Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the June 7th, 2018 town meeting minutes as written. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any more discussion? All those, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the June 14th, 2018 open session minutes as written. Second. Second by Mr. Masseri. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to uh, just quickly um, re just remind you of a couple of weeks ago, um, I appeared to explain uh, <coughs> what we've done so far with our housing production plan. Um, we've been working with uh, Ms. Karen Sonnerborg uh, for over a year now um <coughs> to, <coughs> excuse me, to, um, to create a housing production plan. Um, Ms. Sonnerborg has done a great job for us um, pulling together a report with um, a, a lot of really helpful, useful um, demographic information, assessing our housing needs, um, helping us to figure out uh, where we ought to go next in terms of meeting our affordability needs in the town. Um, and we have, th this process has included um, a community survey, two public meetings, and um, several sessions with uh, the CPC over the course of the last almost two years. And um, I'd like to uh, introduce Ms. Sonnerborg, and she's going to go over uh, the, the final report that we have, which at our recent uh, second community meeting, the CPC uh, voted to accept in order to um, pass along to you to request your acceptance as well, and the next step would be to send to the state for certification. So I'll pass this along to Ms. Sonnerborg, yes. Oh, yeah. Karen, oh, sure. would it be easier for you to work from the table or from the podium? Uh, I, I can do either. Whatever well, we, we want works you to be for you works for me. Same with us. We just want you to be comfortable. You've got a lot of paper there, so I wanted to just give you the option to uh, be most comfortable. you got well, about 12 pounds of paper there. so. Well, I brought the plan. <laughs> in case there were questions that I didn't have memorized, I thought at least I'd have something here that I could refer to. No problem. But I do no, have it's, some it's your choice. Some, uh, well, I, so I need to kind of advance or... Okay. Should be all set. Sorry. About Excellent. That. Thanks for the help. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, are you going to be you're going to be driving the uh, presentation? Uh, uh, no, but I'm going to be uploading it into the share file and Dropbox folder so you can follow along because we did we okay. didn't have it until this evening. Thank you. Please. All right. Thank you all for putting us on your busy agenda this evening, and I. Um, as Daniel mentioned, the document is fairly comprehensive and detailed. Um, 
but I'm going to tonight just try to touch on the key takeaways um, from the housing production plan and move through it uh, relatively quickly. The full draft is on the town's website and uh, so it's available to anybody who wants to look at particular pieces or read the whole thing. Um, just wanted to start with a, a slide that talks about what is affordable housing. Um, the the you know, Heights definition and a typical definition that people use is that if you're spending more than 30% of your income on housing costs, and that's for ownership or for rental, you're overspending and you have what's called cost burdens. The definition that we typically uh, hear about is that uh, under Chapter 40B Comprehensive Permit Law. So for a unit to be counted towards what's called the subsidized housing inventory, towards that 10% affordability threshold, or through annual production goals through this plan, it has to meet a number of very specific requirements. Um, it has to be subsidized in the fact that it's either directly subsidized by a local, state, or federal source, or it's approved by what's called a subsidizing agency that would give the developer a go-ahead to actually, for example, submit a comprehensive permit application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the units all have to be deed restricted, and we're talking more and more about deed restrictions in perpetuity. Um, they have to be affirmatively marketed so that people living outside the community have a chance to know about a potential opportunity and have the ability to apply. I should mention that the requirements under affirmative marketing are very prescriptive uh, by the state, um, but there's something called local preference for uh, a great many developments. Uh, up to 70% of the units can be reserved for those who live or work in the community. Um, so that provides uh, you know, a significant amount of assurance that community residents uh, will be served. Um, the also, the units have to be available to households earning at or below 80% of area median income, and that's for the whole Boston area that goes uh, you know, even counts communities, southern New Hampshire goes way down to where, way out. Um, it's an extensive area. Um, and just to give you an example, um, the 2018 limits, um, these are determined by HUD annually by household size. For a household size of three, $73,000. We're talking about working families. Um, it's not Trump change. Uh, and there is a current gap of about 20 units um, to, for the town to get to that 10% affordability threshold. The town at this point is at 9.59%. Uh, However, uh, if you took out the Edgewood apartment development that was developed under 40R, the town would be at 2.3%. If you looked at just the actual affordable units, the town would be at 4.2%. Um, when the 2020 census figures uh, come out, that year-round total um, number of housing units on which the 10% or housing production uh, goals uh, are derived <coughs> will increase. And so the 10% level will also increase. So it's important for the town to have a cushion. Um, we are submitting this plan under what's called housing production uh, regulations, which are really a subset of the Chapter uh, 40B comprehensive permit <coughs> regulations that were meant to give communities greater control over affordable housing, such that if a town prepared a housing production plan that met the very specific requirements uh, incur included under state guidelines, and then received approval of this plan by the state, 
then produced half of 1% of its year-round housing stock. And for North Reading, that's 28 units right now. It could submit that documentation to the state and become what's called certified, which means that for a 12-month period, it would have the ability to deny what it considered inappropriate um, comprehensive permit applications that it felt did not meet local needs without the developer's ability to appeal that decision. If the town produced 1% of its year-round housing stock, it gets a two-year, what some people refer to as a safe harbor. Um, so beyond just a housing production plan that kind of lays out the current housing dynamic and demographic shifts um, in the, and identifies kind of a proactive approach to uh, addressing local housing needs, the towns can get uh, relief through the certification process. Um, the housing needs assessment um, is a you know, very detailed, comprehensive document, and I'm just going to go over uh, some of the, th uh, the trends that I saw as being uh, particularly noteworthy. Um, the town is uh, experiencing continued population growth. Uh, for example, in 2010, the population, based on the U.S. Census, was 14,682. According to 2016 census estimates, that uh, total increased to 15,396. And then um, based on town uh, clerk records, it's about 15,500 a number of months ago. Projections uh, indicate continued growth, uh, up to 16,500 residents by 2030, um, according to Metropolitan Area Planning Council uh, <coughs> figures, and uh, with continued uh, losses of younger residents and significant Just gains of older ones, with those uh, 65 and over doubling in number uh, between 2010 and 2030. Uh, town is experiencing, uh, on average, increasing affluence. Uh, the median household income um, was $123,103 uh, based on 2016 census estimates, or actually 2015 census estimates, up 134 percent from 52707 in 1989, which was higher than the fashion, uh, 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 inflation during that period of 91 percent. Um, Town has some significant special needs. 1,135 residents, or 7.4 percent, claimed some type of a disability, and that included 23 percent of seniors and 25 percent of vets. Um, and we expect, as the population ages, that the special needs will increase as well. There's been substantial teardown activity, with large homes fueling 75 percent of new housing growth. About 19 percent of the new units involved uh, previous demolition replacement activity. Um, it's hard to find a rental for a two-bedroom unit for less than $1,500. And just that $1,500, you know, very low market uh, rental requires an income of $60,000. If you add in a utilities, though, and look at total housing costs, um, say $200 a month, you're talking about an income of about $68,000. Compared to the median household <coughs> income of renters in uh, North Reading of 52917 who could, based on that 30% affordability threshold, uh, afford a, uh, a rental for a little more than $1,100. Um, an income of about $125,400 is needed to afford the median home priced at $508,950. That median was based on the uh, 2016. 2017 median has increased to $542,000. Uh, 
The median um, has decreased somewhat based on April 2018 figure. This is all from banker and tradesman, uh, the <coughs> Warren Group, you know, tracking of actual sales. It's decreased a bit to about uh, 480,000. But once again, that was a relatively small sample, so it'll be interesting to kind of track uh, the changes going forward. And just something I didn't put on the slide, but I think is worth noting that about half of households earning at or below that 80% of area median income figure were spending more than half their income on housing costs. The Housing Needs Assessment spent a, a great deal of time going through indicators of need for various target populations. Um, but just briefly going through kind of local priorities uh, for addressing housing needs. Uh, and interviews, this would came out as well as in the documents that seniors, uh, an increasing population of seniors uh, largely driven by the baby boom um, will have, uh, have increasingly cost burdens and there are more uh, living alone in the community. Um, those, these individuals and, and families, households need opportunities to affordably downsize in less isolated settings. Uh, have uh, it's been remarked during the planning process that there, the town should consider intergenerational housing opportunities as approach in housing development. Um, Barrier-free uh, units, uh, lower maintenance demands, uh, units where seniors can downsize without the hassles of uh, maintaining their own home. Uh, supportive services. Uh, greater community connections, um, walkability to local services and amenities, um, whole idea of, of providing a context for healthy aging in the community. Um, also, oh, we need to, we cannot forget families uh, in town. There are very few subsidized housing opportunities for families and long waits with also substantial cost burdens. Uh, the need for starter housing um, and even affordable rents are beyond the means of many families. Uh, and these are all indicators that are once again all documented in the, um, doc in, in the uh, plan. Uh, single individuals, including those with disabilities, uh, housing, have unmet housing needs, need smaller barrier-free units, proximity transportation and services were uh, where possible. And veterans, uh, there are 632 veterans in town uh, with a median income of $49,432 and uh, an affordability gap of $300. And that's the difference between um, the median house price and what they can actually afford. Once again, the need for um, starter housing. Um, we did a um, kind of a, a matrix based on uh, the 28 units per year that's required under housing production goals at half of 1% of the year-round uh, housing stock and, and looked at breaking them down by uh, tenure and um, by tenure and um, and uh, the, the uh, target populations and kind of came up with the, a breakdown of 80% rentals to 20% ownership. Uh, about um, half, a, a, signi well, ha a significant population of, um, of renters are paying more than half their, 24% of renters paid at least half their income on housing and most state subsidies are for rentals. Rentals also can turn over more often, so serve more people over time. They um, can deal with some of the most vulnerable uh, residents, residents in the community. And the plan shows some other reasons why uh, rental is a particular uh, focus and priority in this particular plan. Um, and then we also did a distribution of um, units for singles and seniors, uh, small families, and large families. It should be mentioned that at this point, based on an interagency agreement, at least 10% of units um, 
in non-age restricted uh, uh, units must be reserved for uh, families, uh, larger families with at least three bedrooms. Uh, we also put uh, on the bottom uh, another row for special needs where units, f at least 20% of units for singles and, and uh, seniors would be uh, barrier free and or have some supportive services and at least 10% um, for uh, families. Um, so with those needs in mind, we all went, um, moved on to the other required section of the housing plan um, that involve housing production goals and strategies. Um, we took uh, the strategies from a number of sources, uh, and these include the housing needs assessment, uh, the uh, community housing workshop that was held on June 22nd, which was very important. Uh, and we have a summary of the results from that workshop uh, as an appendix to the housing plan. Um, I did a number of interviews with key folks who deal with housing in the, in the community or the region. And we did, as uh, Daniel mentioned, a community housing survey that um, was actually, I mean, it was not scientific, so you can't, you can't it's information you can't uh, kind of assess as being accurate, reliable, as a regular uh, scientific survey with a random sample would be. However, 17% of households in the town responded to it, and that included about 806, 807 responses, a lot more than uh, what I've seen in the past, and uh, you know, very uh, good amount of response. Um, so you how also have hmm? how many more slides do you have? Just a couple more. Thank are you, you, are you want me to move faster? Um, just we have an eight o'clock public hearing, so I don't want to rush you. Okay, all right. I just want to make you. I'll aware. be done in five minutes. I'll try. Um, we also had input, you know, a number of meetings with the community uh, planning commi uh, commission, which was very important, and Daniel was very involved uh, in the draft. We had requirements from the state on production goals, and then throughout the draft, you'll see uh, models that um, we inserted that had worked in other comparable uh, communities. We. Um, we did not do just a laundry list of you know, any strategy we could possibly think of that might work in North Adding. Right. We really, with those sources, tried to whittle down a package of strategies that really kind of made sense for this community that had some um, a fair amount of support. Um, on, in regards to capacity building, uh, we suggest that the town look to secure additional financial resources um, and that includes proceeds from the Berry property, um, that at least some portion of those get funneled in to support uh, increasing the diversity and affordability in the town's housing stock. Uh, to establish an affordable housing trust fund, um, the state now uh, provides enabling legislation that make it very easy for communities to create dedicated funds which they can uh, res uh, manage and then use those funds to subsidize additional housing initiatives. Conducting ongoing community outreach and education is really important. We really try to have robust community uh, input uh, into this housing um, plan and really suggest that any housing initiative going forward have a very inclusive and transparent um, outreach process and preserve existing affordable housing. There are four developments where the affordability restrictions are uh, due to expire at some point in the future. There are a couple of home ownership um, projects where you can't really, uh, when the deed restrictions re expire, it's pretty much it. There's not much that the town can do to extend those. There's a project, a special needs project that um, it likely that the sponsor will look for resources to extend affordability. And then there's Edgewood Apartments. Um, and so the plan suggests that the town, um, you know, have conversations with the owner of those apartments and uh, make every effort to find interventions to extend affordability. <coughs> 
Um, we also included a number of zoning strategies, uh, uh, allowing accessory dwelling units is, uh, is uh, one thing that received a lot of support through the uh, survey and the uh, first community meeting. Um, and we refer to a survey that was done by the town of Needham com of uh, comparable communities and what their experiences has been, have been with respect to accessory dwelling units. Um, we also suggest that the town allow more diverse housing types and more areas to deal with the kind of diversity of local needs from starter housing to housing for empty nesters um, that uh, integrate affordable housing in the open space residential development bylaw through providing some mandates and incentives to include affordable housing and to adopt inclusionary zoning. So as the town grows, it's still making progress incorporating affordability in new development and provide a number of examples how towns are uh, doing that. And under development strategies, uh, one of the, I think the thing, uh, item that I heard most often was on the need for the town to have a vibrant community center. Mixed uses including various housing types um, and that the town has already been making some progress uh, and moving in that direction. Also to make suitable public property available for affordable housing. Um, and um, the town has, for example, an affordable housing overlay district um, that it could, uh, with identified properties that uh, to be affordable and doing a request for proposals and establishing terms and condition on public uh, property um, development um, is a, a part of this housing plan. And then to partner with developers on private properties through existing zoning, through the tweaks that we suggest in, in the plan, and through the, chap the friendly Chapter 40B process. Um, so we have ex actually obtained CPC approval and we're looking for the Board of Selectmen approval tonight so that we can submit the plan to the state. The state has allowed 90 days to review the plan but they are moving much, um, much more quickly. Uh, so um, the sooner we can get in, the sooner we can get uh, the plan approved. So with that, are there any questions? Um, yes, Mr. Schultz. Um, there's a couple of quick questions, a two-part question, basically. I know you had a target of 80% rentals, 20% owner-occupied. Is that set by, DHCD or any is there any so there's no percentage nope. we need nope it, it was based on the, the indicators of need and pragmatic uh, the fact that if you're going to leverage uh, public funds almost all of those funds are for rental units and there's a whole list again of why we thought that rentals made the most uh, sense all right, and the second part of my question is I, I see these a lot in my private practice how is the, if say you had a condo development, you had a two bedroom condo in North Reading that you were going to designate as an affordable housing unit and it was deed restricted? How would you figure out the price of that condo? You'd mentioned that you look at the greater Boston area. My experience is it's kind of town by town is a different price. How would you figure out what North Reading's price would be? You, you know, you basically have to work with the state and in coming up with the price, but it based on if you did look at the tax rate, if condo fee, you, you know, you have to look at uh, you know, private mortgage insurance. A number of items go into actually coming up with that purchase price. And the purchase price would be basically at the 70% of the 80% level because you wanted to have a marketing window. You want the price just at what the person at the maximum income level can afford. But basically, it's a matter of working with the state. And that's town specific, though? The town it's, factors it's come It's project through. specific. Okay. okay. And it's by bedroom size, number of bedrooms, too. Right. It varies. Is there a uh, burning need that we have to approve this tonight? Is there something that happens if we don't approve this tonight? Uh, I, should, I should mention our contract with Karen is through the end of June. That's the end of the term of the grant. So it's not going to be approved just a lot I have just so many questions and we only have a minute and a half so I don't know Mr. O'Leary 
I, I mean, I, I can honestly say I didn't read the whole thing, but I did skim through it, and I have a, obviously an extreme interest in, uh, you know, how are we going to grow as a community and how are we going to meet our affordable housing needs? You know, but getting back to the current units that we have now, and I, I know you identified that uh, you know, we should work with, you know, Lincoln Properties to uh, keep those units that are currently affordable, affordable. Are there any programs that you're aware of statewide that will allow us or assist us in, uh, because most of those have a termination date, you know, 20, 25 years or whatever it was. Uh, what do you see legislatively that's already occurred or may occur that will assist us in maintaining the housing stock, that we, the affordable housing stock that we have now? Because that's the big thing that's going to be confronting this community in the short term. Well, actually, it's a long term because it's, I, but it's short 20, term, 30 Short term as far as the 10% uh, threshold. I mean, we just got over that with the Lincoln Properties. Uh, that's a finite timeline, and all of a sudden, 406 units falls well, off. Well, it won't be a sudden. It's 2038 is the is Th it'll when be it expires. Before we know it. Yeah. Let me just say that there are a number of state initiatives to try to deal with these expiring use projects. They are focusing now on projects that are due, you know, are, are, are due within the next couple years. And they're using, um, for, there's a, a one, prod, one thing called Chapter 40T where you can actually, the state has right of first refusal and you can bring on another developer to take over the project with an infusion of additional financing. There is also what they, they're taking um, a special allocation of uh, rental subsidies like Section 8 um, and they're incorporating those into development to have a regular project-based operating money to keep the units affordable. One would hope when you get close to when this is happening that those same resources will be there uh, to maintain uh, affordability. There, you know, the 40 R's are you know, not on the horizon right yet in the short term. But the idea is to still, you know, have conversations and figure out ways uh, to, uh, to keep the communication open over the next number of years. Yeah. But it's not like it's like going to happen in the next couple years. You've got some time, and hopefully, the state will maintain these resources to support extensions of affordability and any units in the future that are created in perpetuity. Which again impacts the value of the projects that are being financed and built if you're going to have something in perpetuity. I mean, th these uh, developers, as they were looking at this one out here, they were figuring in the value of these units once it expires, too. You know, so this is going to change the dynamics uh, going forward. You know, I, and I, I don't disagree that, you know, as we're looking at, um, you know, the baby boom is aging and looking to age in place and uh, having some... Uh, additional units uh, are allows, allowing in-law apartments and more in-law apartments and that type of uh, uh, zoning changes that we can effectuate here locally. But to me, I'm more concerned with the 40B aspect and what's going to happen going forward as these other units affordability expire. And to me, that's where communities such as ours need some assistance uh, and guidance you know, moving forward. That one project out there took care of a lot of our concerns for a finite period of time. And uh, we recognize that. And I think we're only up to 40R. Uh, we haven't got to S and T yet, but there maybe we are at 40S. But and, and again, by the time this is all expiring, we'll be at 40Y, maybe a Z. But uh, well, uh, And the plan does <coughs> also provide alternatives to kind of be proactively creating housing in the interim. And how are you? How are you found uh, in relation to um, you know mobile homes? You know that has never been recognized by the no, state no. as affordable housing, no. which it most certainly is, and we've had long-term residents here. But doesn't meet all here. those requirements that are mentioned, you know, in, 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 in the draft. Again, and uh, I should also mention that the units have to be permanent, and they, the state does not consider even if the mobile home is on a foundation, they still don't consider it permanent housing. Well, that's what we need. That's what we need to do. We need our legislators to fix it. Because it well, doesn't pass the common sense test. I know, but I got to say a few years ago, you remember that this whole process to repeal 40B, and guess what happened? I uh, it, it's an uphill battle. Yep. 
it, well, it, and I'm not saying that it shouldn't be an uphill battle because the, there should be a responsibility by communities, you know, to meet some affordable housing needs, you know, so that people can age in place and people can afford to, you know, grow up in a community and, and stay there. You know, and if a community is going to make a conscious decision, you know, not to have affordable housing, then there has to be some consequences associated with it. So I don't disagree with the philosophy. Uh, but I want to see some uh, meaningful uh, effort on the part of the legislature to right. allow communities, suburban communities in particular, you know, like North Reading, to assist in meeting these needs. Because now those communities, these urban communities that were that are uh, shouldering the, the entire burden at this point, or most of the burden, are now being priced out. Look what's happening in Boston. You know, the uh, affordable units in Boston are diminishing, you know, by the thousands. Somerville. Annually, in Somerville, Medford. I mean, it's just being pushed out all the way. So there's going to be more pressure on suburban communities uh, to meet the needs. So, you know, with that comes transportation and a whole host of other issues that the legislature has to. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I don't have a problem endorsing the plan that we have before us um, because it's the best laid plan that we have to date. Uh, and we're certainly not, not going to. Um, I don't think meaningfully address the true um, stresses that we're going to be feeling, feeling now and will be feeling in the future until the legislature and the federal government acts. You know, so uh, I think it's a good step. I think, I think it's a terrific report from what I've, I've read no, and, it's a, it's and gathered. No, no, no. Uh, and I think it, it, it clearly did identify, you know, the uh, pressures on the community and what we should be doing. Well, from that standpoint, I'm comfortable yes. with it. Okay. So, if um, any other board members don't have any objection, I'll take a motion to accept this plan. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the 2018 North Reading Housing Production Plan. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very thank much. You thank you very much. much. There's a tremendous amount of work, Karen. Thank you. CPC Board members, thank Danielle. you. Danielle, thank you very much. <laughs> Danielle. But I think that, Mr. O'Leary, you, you bring up a good point that we should we should try to discuss this again once uh, you know, we get closer to October town meeting. I think we should have a, a little free time to start discussing this some more. Okay, we are at the time for the public water hearing, so we'll come back to the water, wastewater update, next steps, in the water restriction. Um, and we'll go right to the public hearing. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to read a meeting notice. Water rate and capital plan <coughs> hearing in accordance with the requirements of section 191-16 and 199-17 of the Code of North Reading. The North Reading Board of Selectmen and North Reading Water Commissioners will hold the annual water rate and water system capital plan hearings on May 8th, excuse me, on Monday, June 18th, 2018 at 8 p.m. in room 14 of the North Reading Town Hall. Mr. Gilberto. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you, I guess the, probably the first thing we should speak to is the status of things with the Andover. Uh, Slipman O'Leary, do you want to update the board? Because it informs yes. the water rate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yes, am uh, very Ray. pleased and relieved to announce that the uh, Andover Board of Selectmen this evening unanimously voted in favor of signing and did sign the Intermunicipal Agreement for 99 years with the Town of North Reading for Portable Water. Unanimous. Unanimously. That's uh, fantastic. And again, I gotta say, uh, bravo to everybody. Bravo, I mean, bravo to everybody. <laughs> and at this particular point in time, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a, uh, a few people. First of all, you know, our team and the negotiating team, you know, Mr. Masseri, myself, the Town Administrator, Mark Clark, uh, Rob Williamson, uh, former. DPW Director Andrew Lafferty and a few other people in between, you know, as far as assisting us on, on our side of the negotiations. Uh, to my colleagues here on the board in relation to uh, paying a, playing a major role in our efforts to negotiate a fair uh, agreement uh, between ourselves and the town of Andover, which has had a long-term relationship, you know, for over 45 years. But this one is for 99 years. And uh, nice. we collectively had taken a, a pretty strong stand in relation to, um, you know, what we needed uh, from the town of Andover in order for them to capture our attention and in order for uh, them to uh, bring us to the table meaningfully and have some meaningful discussion. 
Uh, they did that. You did that. Uh, it took an awful lot of, uh, I think, courage, first of all. I mean, we were at the brink of uh, signing construction contracts in the town of Reading to go with the MWRA. And uh, we made a very conscious decision, a potentially costly decision, to postpone those construction contracts to the tune of, we appropriated $3 million last week, uh, to cover those costs uh, if we had to go forward with the MWRA. Now, the MWRA and the town of Reading have been extremely helpful, and uh, they have, uh, they came to our need, our, our aid, they met our needs, they offered a very fair uh, deal for us for the long-term potable water for North Reading. Uh, they worked very closely with us, and uh, for that we're extremely grateful. Uh, we had an 11th hour opportunity to consider an, uh, an offer from the town of Andover. Uh, we met our fiduciary responsibility. We had that responsibility uh, to meet, and we did, and we considered it. They understood that. They appreciated our position. Uh, they thought they had a deal with us. Uh, they did have a deal with us, and they were very fair, and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, their understanding and working with us. Uh, during the course of the negotiations, uh, if I said it once, I probably said it uh, too many times, uh, North Reading is all set, you know, when we were dealing with Andover, because we were with the, with the MWRA and the town of Reading. Well, I think I can honestly say, and we can all honestly say, that North Reading really is all set for the next 99 years, where uh, we've met our fiduciary responsibility. Uh, North Reading is assured of having good potable water uh, for the long term. And in addition to that, we have a marvelous opportunity to uh, finally get into some expansion, or actually some development of uh, sewerage for the town of North Reading, which is again going to be a true impetus for not only public health uh, needs but also uh, economic development. So this is a, a monumental day for us and for the town of Andover. You know, from an economic standpoint, you know, we're close to 30 percent of their revenue. So they had uh, certainly some incentive to offer what they did. But for, for us, for North Reading, you know, this board has made uh, a good, strong effort to um, take a hard stand, but also a good economic stand for meeting our needs. So um, I applaud all of my colleagues here, the administration, Mark in particular, who probably spent as much time in Andover as he did in North Reading for the <laughs> last four months. Um, but truly, and for, for Andover, uh, again, while we may not have appreciated so much their timing of things, which is the 11th hour opportunity. Uh, they understood their responsibility in that the decision they made in 2013 and 14 cost this community you know, almost a million dollars. They will pay us back. You know, they're offering us an opportunity whereby North Reading, the town of North Reading as a customer, will not pay any more than 95% of their lowest tiered customer. That's not to say that North Reading customers are not going to pay more for their water rate because we still have to maintain our own water system. But we will be paying far less for the water that we're currently paying for going forward for the next, forward for the next 99 years. So they've met their responsibility in recognizing, first of all, that their decision costs the town of North Reading time and money. And they're also meeting the res res responsibility to their rate payers in assuring that you know, their capital costs, which again will be shared by North Reading, will remain uh, affordable. And uh, it's a really win-win for both communities. So I am happy that this is finally over. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, our wives are finally happy that this is over. And uh, Mr. Masseri now probably won't have a drink tonight after this thing, uh, mm -hmm. after this vote. But to Representative Jones, the effort that he put in to make sure that the special, special legislation was uh, ushered through in such a timely fashion, I mean, it, amazing. I personally called him the other day to thank him. I mean, it was, uh, we had some setbacks along the way as far as um, requirements, as far as posting requirements of the special legislation and all the rest, which set us back probably three weeks. And in a series of hours almost, it seemed like hours, he was able to get it through the House, 
uh, Senator Tao was able to get it through the Senate. And it was on the governor's desk by last Wednesday, last week, and then the governor signed it Wednesday. I mean, phenomenal. Uh, I called him personally and thanked him uh, for his effort in shepherding it through the legislature, which was not an easy task. Whereby we had an awful lot of competition. If you think about you know spring town meetings and home rule petitions, uh, hundreds of them, and it could move to the forefront, to the top of the pile, and he really did a fantastic job. And uh, along, I mean, he does a great job in representing us anyway. But this was a, a monumental task, and uh, he got it done. And again, to the governor for taking it up and signing it. Kudos to him too. Uh, it really means a lot, a lot to both communities. So, with that being said. Uh, our water rates won't be as high next year as we anticipated. So Oops. that's a good thing. Right, Mark? Don't say that. Don't say <laughs> that? <laughs> I'm saying it. Yeah. I, I won't be voting for it anyway. <laughs> Mr. Masseri. I, I couldn't say any of this in, any better than Steve, but I will say this, that uh, as a team, there were times when we could have walked out. There was frustration, and we kept at it. And the results are here, and we should all be proud. I really thank the remaining the, the three members of the board that were part of the negotiation team for sticking with us, and uh, and also to give us a little advice on how to you know approach this from the point of view of getting something that is worth the North Reading. And as Steve said, it's a win-win for both communities. There's no doubt about that. Well, the best part is. No board member, uh, at least none of the board members sitting here at this table, will ever have to address this again for a long, long time. And I think that's a, a thing that we should take comfort in. Um, and, you know, 99 years is a long way away. None of us will be here then. But the people that come after us, I think, will should take comfort in it. A lot of effort, especially on all of your parts. And this is a big deal for us. But, you know, I don't want us to lose sight. I don't want us to lose sight of August 2014 when we were left with no water source we were done you know that letter when that came in from Andover was a real kick in the pants right right in the gut and I don't want us to lose sight of that and I want to thank MWRA in Reading coming to our aid we owe it to them and but in the end like you said Mr. O'Leary we had to make we had to look at this from a fiduciary responsible perspective. In bold opportunities, when we met the, all the requirements on each end, it did come down to price at the end. And tonight is a perfect example of why this decision, I know I voted for it. Because you know, this is a $17 million net savings for us when we're all said and done that we know of. Right? That we know of. There was even though the MWRA is a wonderful water source and Reading is a wonderful community to work with, but there was still a tremendous amount of unknowns, a lot of hurdles that we still had to continue. And I don't think Mark will argue with me on any of this. I mean, you certainly can, but I think there was still a lot of unknowns with going down that path that, again, would have had a negative effect here. And, you know, our rate payers on the water side have, haven't had it easy. And, you know, I, I look forward to this hearing tonight, and I look forward to voting on the rates um, because this is the way it should be. And I think we all did a great job. We should be applauded. And I want to thank Andover for unanimously supporting it as well. And it shows their community that they took it serious for them because it would have been a massive increase on their rate payers, and they deserve better. So I'm glad Karma Heads prevailed, and I'm glad we are where we are. So if there is any, nothing else to be said, I would like to turn it over to Mark, and we'll get through the water here. And Mr. Gilbert. Just very quickly, so so this development does play directly into the recommendation of the Department of Public Works and the water okay. superintendent. Which set of proposals do you have up here? Now? We, have a, <laughs> uh, we have a recommendation that reflects this action, um, which uh, uh, I think is certainly to the advantage of our rate payers. Uh, I think this board is well aware, or some of the members are well aware, of the presentation that we made in June of 2015, where we showed consecutive years of uh, seven percent average rate increases uh, we had begun implementing that and uh, that was in preparation for the significant capital project and buy-in that would be required um, w this does alter the course for us um, this is the first step um, tonight's rate hearing there will be future uh, years where there may be an impact felt where uh, an increase that would have been a, to a larger percentage will be a smaller percentage now 
and uh, there will also need to be in, uh, some action taken by town meeting at the appropriate time to potentially rescind some appropriations that were previously authorized as well. That'll all happen afterwards. Tonight is about the water rate effective July 1st, 2018, just a few short weeks uh, and uh, next year. And with that, I will turn it over to the Acting Tele Public Works Director, Mark Clark. Thank you. Um, I just want to recognize the, uh, the water commissioners that are here with me tonight. Um, we have uh, Amit Subramani, uh, I don't know if you want to just read yet. Uh, Andrew Street and Chair is Vinnie Ragucci. Um, just want to thank them for their efforts uh, in supporting the Water Department. Uh, Vin especially has been on for a number of years. Um, I also want to just say thanks to you guys as the board and the town administrator. Um, this truly was a culmination of a team effort and without everybody being on the same page. And it took some hard line stances at times, but North Reading was united in that and I think that really helped uh, get the message across to the people that needed to hear it in Andover. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. I, I have to say, uh, having been through the process, um, I'm proud to be an employee of North Reading. Um, North Reading, I think, just had uh, the right demeanor through the whole process. Um, we were professional, we were uh, courteous, um, we were curt when we needed to be. Um, just, I think from my spending my time in Andover, if I, if I heard Mr. O'Leary say we're all set one more time. I was going to get up and walk out of the meeting. <laughs> but it was an effort and we got there and, and it is really a great thing, um, which brings us to tonight, which we got to get kind of back down to normal business. Um, I want to kind of take a step back, tell you guys where we are, um, look at the current fiscal year and then look ahead to FY19. It's hard to look too far ahead and I'm not going to do any long-term projections, but uh, we'll try to get through it one year at a time at this point. So if you're familiar with this, the Water Department has two retained earning funds, uh, one being the Stickney Fund, which that goes back way back to the contamination of the Stickney well in the, the 1970s. That fund does still exist. There's still about $133,000 in that fund. Uh, we have a separate fund called the Water Department Infrastructure Stabilization Fund. Uh, as you may recall from June Town Meeting, we transferred in just over a million dollars into that fund, and the total between the two funds now is just over two million dollars. Um, we're in relatively good shape. Uh, some of you may recall 10 or 15 years ago when we were borrowing money from these funds rather than putting money into these funds. And uh, again, the boards at that time took the actions needed to, uh, to help stabilize the, the water enterprise. Um, where are we in the current fiscal year? So I'm going to kind of concentrate on FY18 over on the right-hand side of this. Um, just basically shows the, the uh, monthly income. So we have four big billings per year, uh, generally in August, November, February, and in May. Um, looking at that, our projected water billing for the current year is about $4.3 million. Um, we collect some money from last fiscal year, the uncollected from last year, then we'll have some uncollected this year. Um, but when we factor in as well, we're not going to expend the entire FY18 budget. Bottom line, we should be putting $180,000 to $200,000 into the reserve fund or uh, the, that I just showed in June of next year. Um, and again, some of these statements I'm going to make are kind of pre the Andover agreement, so I'm going to kind of make my statements, take a look at where we would be, and then we'll come quickly back to, to where we are with Andover. Um, budget for this current fiscal year, again, bottom line down at the very bottom. Water Department budgeted at town meeting $4.638 million compared with $4.306 million, about $313,000, if I can see that correctly, increase, uh, which is about 7.7%. Uh, the town administrator reflected that if you look back in uh, FY15, we had made a projection of 7% increases over a number of years in order to meet the MWRA. Uh, without the Andover situation, that's about where I would be making a budget recommendation tonight is about a 7.7% rate increase. Uh, again, the kind of couple of the budget drivers are personnel services. I want to focus on this one. This is the purchase of water from Andover. Uh, the existing, or the prior, I should call it now, the prior IMA with Andover called for a 5% rate increase uh, in, from FY18 to FY19, which results in about an $85,000 increase. Uh, again, it's shown there as a 5% increase. That's one of the things we're going to be avoided, and I'm going to touch on those really quickly here. Um, indirect costs, I, I described this in my memo a little bit, but indirect costs are costs the Water Department 
as an enterprise fund pays to other town departments in order to cover the uh, kind of the benefit we receive from those departments. So the insurance, the pensions and benefits, uh, the, the outside DPW help that we get, say if we have a water main break and we pull a couple of highway guys over. So we've historically, uh, over the last four or five years, been budgeting about a 3% increase. So there's FY16, 17, 18, and 19. We're up to about $450,000 in those indirect costs that actually get charged back to other town departments, which if you're truly an enterprise fund, that's how you have to, have to operate. So there it is. This is the act, the 99-year agreement between the town of North Reading, as you can see, as Mr. O'Leary uh, pointed out, the two boards signed this on, July, on uh, June 4th, House of Representatives signed that on June 6th, Senate signed it on June 7th, and on June 13th, the governor signed it. So it got pushed through really, really quickly. Um, I'm just going to say this. So one of the agreements, and we're going to come to this in a second, part of the agreement was that the year, the fiscal year in which this agreement was signed, North Reading retroactively got 95% of Andover's rate back to July 1st of that fiscal year. We're in month 12 of this fiscal year, so we're now due that credit in all of FY18. And there was a lot of push from the team that went in order to get this accomplished. And in order to, we actually inserted provisions to guarantee that payment back to us. But uh, what's that total? What's the total? Uh, I believe it's about three hundred and forty thousand dollars at this point. So there's just a, a, again a good kudo to the people that, that worked on that. So what does the Andover agreement do? Why don't we need a 7.7 percent .7 rate increase this year? Here's a couple of terms right out of the uh, the Andover agreement. For the first 10 years of this agreement, and I think we're all aware of this. North Reading shall pay Andover for its water use at a rate of 95 percent of Andover's Tier One water rate. We were scheduled to go to three dollars and 59 cents per hundred cubic feet. This pulls us down to two dollars and 90 cents per hundred cubic feet. So instead of 3.59, we're paying 2.90. It's a huge savings. Um, and that's, again, that's where that 343000 in this current fiscal year uh, results. Um, <clears throat> for the first 10 years, we will not exceed a 2.5% rate increase per year for those first 10 years. So even if Andover were to go up 5% on their residential rate, we would only see a 2.5% increase in those first 10 years. Um, and then what happens after that for the remainder, this is section B, for the remainder of the term, North Reading shall pay Andover for its water use at a rate of 95% of Andover's Tier 1 rate. That gives us the long-term stability we've been looking for in our water rate. Um, again, Selectman Prisco mentioned the 2014 agreement. Uh, that was an exit strategy for us to agree to that. Um, it included some fairly extraordinary, those 5% increases per year in water rates uh, really drove up the cost to the, uh, the no North Reading rate payer. Here's another one that was mentioned. Andover will reimburse North Reading's cost already incurred to join the MWRA up to $953,000. So what it's going to happen is we're going to get credited every month $7,941.66 for the next 10 years. That amounts to that $95,300 per year times 10 gives you the $953,000. Can you just answer, does that translate to a rate payer seeing a credit on their bill? Uh, it does not. Well, I, I, I'll explain this as we get a little further into it. I just it. want to make sure you, you know, that, that okay. goes back to the enterprise. Correct. Not directly to the to Correct. The right. You got my hopes up. I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's an excellent question. Can you make sure you... Well, you know, I had somewhat the same question because, you know, when you take the 340, 340K that you talked about, plus this 95,000, know, does that have a, a positive or negative effect for FY 2019? It should have a positive effect. You, you one would think so, yeah. Yes, it w and we'll get to that fairly yeah. shortly. Okay. Yes, well, because I think it has a positive effect by keeping the rate clamped. And I also think the previous two slides and what the team did was give us a, a planning mechanism for the next 10 years so that if we do a, know their rate is increasing, we can plan accordingly. It, it doesn't mean we are reducing our rate. It, 
you know, but we can keep it on track for that period of time when it goes comes out of the 10-year cap and goes into the 95% of their tier one. So it, it helps us in terms of our, our planning too. With the and, water and, and again, that's an excellent point. North Reading has the ability to set our own water rates. So Andover is going to do what they're going to do with their water rates. We still have the ability to look out three years and say, wait a minute, there's going to be a bump in our rate. Let's smooth that out. Or let you, So we have absolutely autonomy over our own water rates. Uh, we're not tied to you know decisions they make per se. Um, again, the adjustment, this just relates to this current fiscal year. Uh, Andover agrees to set effective rate of 95% of their tier one rate retroactive to July 1st. And again, right now that's looking at about $340,000 in the current fiscal year. Um, so when I said we're projecting $180,000 in retained earnings for this fiscal year, that will be supplemented by the offset uh, or this uh, effective rate going back to the start of the fiscal year. So realistically, the, uh, the retained earnings for this year likely will be in the $500,000 range once this is said and done. What's that total balance today? It's just over $2 million. It's $2,025,000, I believe. But that's the Stickney Fund plus the yeah. water infrastructure and stabilization. We'll potentially add another four hundred. dollars uh, I did just want to talk about debt service. So this is another budget driver. Uh, FY18, the debt service, and this is for the large capital projects that are out there. Uh, the two big ones that are on the books are the third water storage tank over at Swan Pond, we're still paying for that, uh, and the meter project that we're, we're currently underway with. Um, but there are a bunch of little things if we buy a, a backhoe out of the water department that gets added to the water department uh, debt service. If we do studies, they get added. So anything done to supplement the water department is paid for through the water department budget. Uh, the, the projected number for FY19 was $907,000. Again, a fairly significant increase, especially when you look at the percentage increase on top of what it was. We need to go back and revisit our debt service. Uh, as you guys are aware, and Selectman O'Leary mentioned, we appropriated over $8 million at June 2017 town meeting for construction. Um, we're not going to be constructing the interconnection with the MWRA. So we're going to have to go back and look at and rescind some of that money. Um, we may have to reappropriate certain money. So there are things that were definitely targeted towards design for the MWRA. Um, the other one that's out there, and we need to have a serious conversation about this, is we, we purchased a piece of property in order to put that pumping station on. Uh, the town has to decide how they want to dispose of that property. Not something we need to decide tonight, but again, these factors are going to roll into the debt service. So we're showing a hundred fifty thousand dollar increase in the debt service. It actually is not going to be that 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 large once we uh, actually shake out all the books on it. Um, the one other item I did want to mention is so in the water department uh, personnel costs, we have something that's called salary contingency. Um, it's for there are two treatment plan operator positions that are in the water department budget. Um, understanding that if we were to go to MWRA or Andover long term, the water department would likely not be staffed at the level it has historically been staffed. Um, these two positions have been vacated <coughs> for a couple of years and uh, again we're showing them as a salary contingency. This money has not been spent in, the, in FY17 or FY18 um, and, like, and I'm not going to recommend filling those two positions in the FY19 budget. So there's another $100,000 in the budget that uh, likely will not be expended in FY19. And I just wanted to throw this out there. The, uh, the town was awarded, and again, it's a lot of effort on a lot of people's parts. I know Danielle's left, but she worked significantly in this, uh, and Selectman Prisco, uh, the Mass Works Infrastructure Program. We were awarded a $3 million water infrastructure improvement grant from the state. Um, we haven't formally uh, defined where that money's going to go, but again, it's a... <laughs> It's nice to have a little extra money in your in your pocket. So three million dollars will help. Um, we're going to use that towards uh, you know towards this whole Andover uh, project. Yeah, it's important to note that the application for this changed midstream. Yes. Uh, so that it could allow cover money. allow us whether we went MWRA or Andover. And again, uh, much uh, thanks to the again to the, the chairman and the administration, but also Representative Jones yeah. and. Uh, 
Senator Shire and the uh, Baker Polito uh, administration for listening and working with us. And Secretary Ash as and well. Secretary Ash for sure. He, he was very helpful in allowing us to modify the language to be a little more vanilla. So, and it was in the, uh, it was very late in the process. Absolutely. So, we appreciate it. Again, a lot of hard work went into everything we're seeing here tonight. So, so where does that take us? Uh, again, I was mentioning that without the Andover Agreement, we likely need a 7.7 percent increase in the water rates in order to uh, support the FY19 budget. Um, basically, what you're seeing here is we're recommending. I'm recommending a zero percent increase in the water rates. So the tier one, tier two, and tier three rates that we have this fiscal year. Um, looking to actually carry those into next fiscal year. So the savings from the reduced rate that we'll be paying Andover, the savings from the, uh, the credit that comes back from Andover, and then uh, the lower debt service and that those uh, salary contingency money will be sufficient to offset what has been, had been projected to be an increase in the budget. Um, this is a transition year. I can't give you a great projection in terms of what, at the end of FY19, we're going to be saying is the um, likely retained earnings from FY19 yet. Um, and to some degree, FY20 also will be a transition year. Um, but I'm confident that where we stand right now, the current rates will be sufficient to cover our expenses for the coming year. Um, just highlighted there, I'm just going to point out a couple quick things. The, uh, we are recommended just very modest increases in the meter charges. Uh, as you're aware, we're putting in new meters in town. Um, there's a slight increase in the cost of the meters and the technology that we're using. So this really wouldn't impact the current users. Uh, if your meter fails, your meter's under warranty. It's more if you're building a new house in town and you need it's a new service that we have to supply a meter to, we're basically just looking to cover our cost. Uh, so we're looking to just jump those meter charges up slightly as shown there. Um, and then I've, I've asked to change the, uh, we have a, a final meter reading fee. So if we go out and do a final water meter reading on a property, we charge for that. We have to have a guy go out and physically read the water meter, come back in, enter a bill. Um, just changing that to a, a, what I'm calling a special meter fee, which would uh, be anything other than a standard meter reading. Um, Mr. Masseri. Mark, where are we with the water meter, the new water meter install? So we started uh, in earnest about May 1st. Um, we were working primarily in, by section in town, and the area we worked is kind of the area east of Haverhill Street and north of Elm Street, kind of the northeast corner of town. Uh, to date, we've got about 640 water meters in out of 4,800. So we're about an eighth of the way through. We're about 12 and a half, 13 percent uh, through the installation process right now. Um, some people have gotten one, two, and even their third notice about installing the water meters. We also sent out a, uh, one of the reverse 911 phone calls to try to encourage people. So we definitely would encourage people. Um, what we're trying to avoid is having him at 3 o'clock doing the meter over on the end of Elm Street and then at 3.30 being scheduled at Town Hall on North Street. We're trying to keep the, uh, the people working just to be as efficient as possible in the same part of town. Mr. Masseri. This is more for the public. But uh, I had my water meter installed. It took 20 minutes. It took my wife maybe a couple of hours my, uh, to clear the area so they could work. So I would encourage people to and get this done. It was your done. stuff she had to move probably, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, right. Well, it was our stuff. I'd like to add to that, though. I, I received my letters in the mail, and I used the online scheduling system, which was extremely easy it gives you all the dates and times available to you so I encourage people to use it you pull out your calendar you can look and you have multiple options and I think it's extremely user-friendly it took me less than two minutes and I was able to lock it in on a date and time that fit with my schedule and gives me enough time to clear out the area <laughs> where I need to get to so I encourage people to use it it works great and um, I you know with this is in the best interest of everyone you know, we want to control the rates this is going to help us do that and I think you know we're not going to increase the rates tonight but if we don't get these meters done I'm not saying it is a threat but this is sort of the big picture perspective of how why the road we're going down here 
if the community doesn't cooperate and work with us, then we're going to go back to having discussions again about changing these water rates because what do we do if we don't replace them all? Mr. Masseri. Just one more question for Mark. Uh, re related to the water meter install, I would imagine this slots of time when they're going to be they're installing water meters. Are we having problems such that they're doing nothing in periods of the time of the day? Uh, generally, so they send us a schedule every day about, and they've had just two installers in town to date. Uh, they're looking to ramp that up to three and then eventually four installers so that it'll start going a little bit quicker. Um, they're trying to finish off, I believe it's Bill Ricca is the other community they're doing currently. Um, but they're generally busy all day. So they do run into, your appointment was probably a, a typical appointment that it takes about 20 minutes to actually do the job. There are appointments where there are more difficult uh, issues. Um, valves breaking closed before the meter uh, or they need to call us out to, out to shut the water off at the street because they won't touch the valve before the meter just because of the condition of it. So um, they're generally busy all day. Um, again, they, we're looking at some point to probably open it up to an occasional Saturday as well or maybe some evening appointments for, for people that have had difficulty. But they are, they are fairly flexible in their, their appointment scheduling. And uh, again, the comments I've heard back from people is that the couple of gentlemen that are in town are very professional about this. They've been working for this company, uh, some of them for 20 plus years. So, you know, it's, they're not novices. They know what they're doing. They've probably seen any issue they're gonna come across before and they're uh, and doing a fairly good job. I just want to go back to my comment earlier, and I think we need to, before we decide on the water rate tonight, is to make sure that the board at least has an idea of how you want to handle the situation when we don't have, we have multiple people not wanting to replace their meters. You know, because think about that. Now we're going to have to send an individual out to those individual houses to get a water rate, I've got a water reading. I mean, that's going to be insane to spend that kind of money. Um, to have a person to go read one or two houses on a particular street. It's going to have a negative effect here. So we have to come up with an idea. Because we're not going to get 100%. So if, if I can just share, and we had a little bit of discussion with this in the Water Commission meeting. Uh, we kind of view three different types of people that, uh, that may challenge the need to have a new meter in their home. One would be people who believe there's a, an absolute health effect from the radio waves that the, the meters are putting off. Um, the radio transmitter in almost every case is being mounted on the outside of the house. Um, there's study after study that show that the, the radio uh, emissions from these devices are hundreds and thousands of times below some of the other devices you use in your home. A uh, cell phone, think about a cell phone is yeah. right up next to your ear, right up next to your brain versus a transmitter box on the outside of your house. Um, so there, there isn't a whole lot of credence to that. Uh, the second is the big brother uh, kind of group of people that don't want any governmental interference in their homes. Uh, they think that we're able to you know, tell what internet they're watching or what television shows are on in their house. And uh, again, that's not what these are able to do. They're able to read your water meter once an hour and then once a day they transmit those 24 hourly readings to town hall. Um, and then the third, the, the third party we would suspect are people that don't want their water meters changed because they may have tampered with their water meter over the years and these are going to be virtually tamper proof. You're not going to be able to, if you've somehow doctored your meter, and there are ways to do it, they're not, it's not rocket science, but if you doctored your meter, these new devices are going to show that very quickly. Um, if you I don't want to give away any practices, but so there, there may be that. So again, I've talked to people from other towns, and there are occasionally one or two people in the, in an entire town. We're not talking ten percent, but there are one or two people that, uh, for whatever reason, absolutely opt out of the uh, the meter program. Can we have some people have threatened rates? to shut off water uh, and and deny service? Can we have different rates for those people? Again, so if we look at this, we've, we've added this, we've changed it from final meter reading to special meter reading. Uh, we certainly want to discourage them by charging them at least the cost it costs us. It's, we're looking to go 100%. That's our goal in this, yeah, the efficiency absolutely. that's there. And we've invested a lot of time 
looking at the water meters and a lot of time choosing the right program for North Reading. And this is an absolute benefit to the town. The amount of, and it's going to be a benefit to the residents too. I think it, some of your higher tech guys are going to get into it and it'll actually call you if it suspects there's a leak on your toilet. It will give you a notification. You'll get an email notification on your, your, your phone or your tablet telling you, look, you have consistent water use at your house and based on the flow rate, we suspect it's your second floor bathroom. You, you know, your toilet on your second floor bathroom. It's that, that precise, this information is going to be able to tell you. Um, it's going to be a good thing. Before you hit the second tier, you'll be able to program in to say, wait a minute, I'm getting close to the second tier. I need to knock off. I got to yell at my teenage kids to get out of the shower quicker so that we're not jumping into that higher rate. So there's an absolute benefit back to the user as well. Um, <clears throat> but we're trying, you know, we're just trying to get 100% compliance at this point. That's the goal. Please get to uh, I think that's about it. That's it? Okay. Yeah, so I just had a question slide. Any other questions for Mr. Clark? No. So again, just to summarize, where would we have been without the Andover agreement? I would have been in front of you recommending between a 7 and an 8% rate increase for next year. Um, basically in front of you right now saying that the, uh, the provisions of the contract we've entered into do away with the need of a rate increase at all for FY19. So what you presented tonight talks about about a $435,000 of money re being returned, whether it's in the uh, transferred through um, offsets when you submit invoices to Andover. I'm not sure how you, or they're cutting a check. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but the number is roughly about $430,000. and. You, I've heard you say about that going into the stabilization. Is that the plan? So, if, if you notice, the the rate or the uh, the budget went up by three hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. So, the first three hundred thirteen thousand dollars of savings is what allows us not to have to raise the the rate this year. Beyond that, and there will be money beyond that, will go to retained earnings next year, and then we'll be back at this point next year with a okay. kind of a year's worth of data under our belts, able to say. What do we need to do for So you're saying the increases system. that you put in your budget is about 313000 Correct. You, you deduct that from the 435 still leaves you with roughly 100 grand. Correct. Um, okay. And again, once we have to, um, once we determine what our actual infrastructure costs are going to be to build some treatment plants for the water coming in, again, we appropriated up to three million dollars for that already uh, but once we finalize what the debt service is going to be and what the projects are going to be that will also and again in this year or two cusp period we'll be able to determine exactly yeah. what uh, the retained earnings level we want to maintain and what do we foresee as far yeah. as uh, capital and projects going forward to coming out of the water enterprise so so tonight are we doing two motions one for the water rate and one for the fees or is it all one all one so I do not like the way we structured the rate regard in regards to the new water meters. Uh, I think we need to be very strict. I think it needs to be significantly more than it is now. Uh, what, as far as putting the new meters in? That's right. If people aren't going to do it, it's a, I don't think you get the, r the cost right. Uh, You're talking about the non-compliant people. That's correct. Yes. Because when you look at a fully loaded rate of sending an individual to drive in a town vehicle, Go out to the house, get the reading, come back, install it into the into the system. Someone's gonna have to do all that. When you track the touches in that whole process now for each individual house that doesn't put in these electric meters, I can't imagine that that rate covers it. But you did the work, so Tom, not that smart. So sure. help me out. I'll just give you the argument we hear from the other side. I believe that this rate. So looking at it as a final meter reading, if you're gonna sell your house, that's just the process we have to do right now. It's the guy's mm -hmm. gotta create a, a work order, go out in his truck, get the reading from your house, come back, enter it, hand enter it into the computer, and generate a bill. It takes us less than an hour to do a final meter reading. And, and the, you know, the cost of a guy plus the, uh, the benefits is about that amount. Um, the complaint we obviously get from the real estate agents is, gee, $50 is pretty high for a final, final meter reading. Um, I think, I, I think, yeah, I think it's adequate. Um, if you're looking to do something different, if you're looking to discourage people and encourage them to allow the, the smart meter to go in their home, 
that's a different a different outlook. It's this this is a cover and cost type approach versus a. Well, I think you were talking about the installation of the meters or lack of installation of a meter more than the final meter reading. So exactly. So right. you take Bishop's way. If my neighbor doesn't put the meter in, and you guys now are getting all the data, now you have to send an individual up to those homes that don't do it. They have to get in the vehicle, go there, get that information. Well, I would think I would say we would give them a monthly reading, which is going to cost them six hundred bucks a year, rather than a quarterly meet reading, because we're getting daily readings from everybody else with the new meters. So I think from a policy standpoint, we're going to do a monthly meter reading, potentially, I, which would be I, encouraging I, people to participate. That, that works I, to me. To me, you know that that works as, as opposed to a quarterly meter reading. Like we're going to be getting daily meter readings at, with the new meters. We're going to be getting hourly. Oh, meetings. hourly, but okay, but to me, if we're going to encourage people to participate, it would be through, if you're not participating, we're going to be reading your meter at least monthly, which is at 50 <coughs> bucks a pop, $600 more per year plus your usage. Plus your usage. Okay. I, that was, yeah. as you were speaking, yeah. I'm thinking out, I'm thinking out loud. I right? don't see that, but I, that's kind of the road I'd like to go down. And I think we need uh, to figure it's that possible to do that. Motion. I would say I would say this. The other thing that we've discussed, and I haven't even discussed this with the town administrator, so I'm just going to kind of throw this out there. Uh, <laughs> rather than having some type of external reading devices on those homes, we want to go in and physically look at the meter itself. So go into the cellar and get that reading once a month. Because again, the third category of people we're we're targeting that we want to definitely get these hourly meeting meter readings in is the tamperer. And fifty dollars a month, if you're paying a, a two thousand dollar a quarter irrigation bill, fifty dollars a month is nothing to you, you know, to because I oh I gotta pay that once a month, that's six hundred dollars a year, but I can still tamper with my meter. So we wanna actually get eyes on those situations in all in all situations. Did this come up in your water commission discussions? This you part guys, did a little bit, yeah. Do you guys have a theory or an idea or do you wanna share? Or? Your thoughts? Are, I'm just curious what their opinion is on this. I think I, Mr. Yeah, O'Leary and I are on the I, same I think page. the implementation, the timing of the implementation is, is questionable only because, you know, we're 12% through it. At this point, we anticipate most of it being done by when? Uh, we're looking to finish by about the end of November. Okay. So then can we amend this at a later date once you're closer to completion for those that are not compliant? To, to implement it now might be a little bit premature, but I think you got to do it now because I, I don't know. I'm just asking if we got to amend the rates. I think we have to be transparent. I think we have to be honest. We don't want to turn around and do it later. I think we should be honest. We're in the start of this program, and people should know in town that what our philosophy is as a board, that how serious we are about this investment we've made in these meters, Mr. Colbera. So just with regard to that, I think that you have some, you know, the finance director is not here, but I think you have flexibility with regard to the rate. But the, as we get closer to tax recap time, their DOR is going to want to see an approved rate structure and uh, will probably frown upon it being changed. Um, but uh, I'm going to echo the sentiment. I mean, I believe we're investing in a $1.5 million plus system to get everybody on that system. And, you know, even to have to maintain that parallel structure for manual meter reading, is uh, you know, it's going to be there's going to be an expense and an obligation associated with that that we're trying to move away from, and so. Uh, well, it's going to be borne by a few people. Yeah, so that concerned. just may be it. It may be that you know that the share of that cost now becomes much much greater because there's fewer yeah. meter readings that we're doing. That's correct, Ms. Mr. Minupelli and then Mr. Schultz. Just I know that it's a it's a better technology, but we were converting to the smart readers also for the accuracy of of the readings that are coming from them. Therefore, the, the homes that refuse or uh, reject the attempt to swap out the meter, wouldn't you be able to do estimated readings of those? Um, and uh, I thought we talked about this before. Be concerned with our estimates, meaning high. Well, you, you <laughs> can't verify the accuracy because it's not being changed, right? Right. So it doesn't matter if you send someone out there to read the meter. We're not. We're not. Sh we're replacing them for accuracy purposes. So the new meters will actually read to the nearest tenth of a gallon. The older meters that we're reading from the outside 
we can only read to the nearest thousand gallons from the outside. The, you can actually read the meter to the nearest gallon if you go in, uh, even the older style meters, which would be another re reason to encourage uh, going into the properties and reading the meter directly to get that, that level of accuracy off the meter. I think of the three different water customers that you describe. Obviously, the first uh, customer that believes that it's a, a, a health threat that you can clearly review the data that you have with them and go over that information with them and that should resolve that issue because they can read through or review the same data that you that you obtained in order to dispel that notion right and sure. the, this the second the second um, customer that you describe um, I don't know how you handle that one, but the third customer that you're worried about a tampering, I don't know it off the top of my head, but isn't there a, couldn't we ask our attorney, I think there's a regulation that prohibits that tampering with the... We have, we have fines in here, and there's meter tampering in our fines. Again, if you read down about two-thirds of the way down this page, meter tampering, $300, uh, $300 per event. But you could you could pretty much calculate if there's X number of people living there are X number of bedrooms based on an average of what you know s similar occupancies are what the us usage Again, could be you right? Are, you'd, be, you'd be surprised the range of usage that you see from house, house to house. Your next door neighbor could use 20% of the water that you do. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that's, yeah. I have I, I have some <laughs> OCDs that like to show, yeah, <laughs> take a lot of showers. But but uh, what I'm saying is that that you would be able to see that, right? Would you be able to see that disparity where it's a lot lower than you would expect it to be for for a property? So let's say they're not, they don't get their water from any other source other than the town. Right, wouldn't you be able to figure that's probably a tampered meter? There are ways to tell meters have been tampered with. So we put what's called seals on the meters. We, we yeah. put a, co a little piece of wire through them and we you know, put a lead stamp steel that says North Reading Water Department on it. And there's no way to monkey, well, there are ways. Yeah. But <laughs> there are very few ways to yeah. change. But again, there's a labor intensive thing. It's a very labor intensive thing. And you'd have thing. to go out is there. there and is, is there something more of just a policy change that we need to make yeah, as far as the uh, frequency there. of meter reading? I have an idea. You know, uh, you know say, say starting January 1st, you go to a monthly, monthly meter reading for those that are not compliant, uh, it, whereby the rates wouldn't have to change. The just fee, the special the meter fee reading fee would reading. be kicking in for those those customers. I, I, I don't know. I, I, again, we probably would need to come back and modify the rules and regulations specific to those conditions. And is that just a vote, that's just a vote of the board or is it? Uh, it would be something the Water Commission would recommend and the board would vote oh, on okay. in terms of what the, uh, what the rules and regulations are. I'd like are. to hear Mr. Schultz's idea. Yeah, Mr. Clark, I, I think your $50 special reading fee, that's what I see across other towns too, so I think that's reasonable when you're selling a house kind of a thing. But to kind of tag along with Mr. O'Leary's just mm -hmm. saying, I would propose that for the, you know, we may have a handful of people who, for whatever reason, don't want to do this. I think if we're getting, you said we're getting hourly readings or daily readings from every resident that has a new meter, I think at a minimum, the people that don't want to get involved in this should be read at least once a week. And that's going to be $300, $240 to $300 a month. That's going to end that problem real soon. I mean, it may be labor intensive for a month or two to do that, but I think that's going to encourage people to get 100% compliance. I think even if you're tampering with the meter, you're not saving $300 a month. Right. So I think that's the way you nip that in the bud and you don't have to change these rates. I think I we think need something. I, I, I do think tonight <coughs> is the night we should just start determining. Or we set the rate tonight, but we should put it back on the agenda very quickly uh, to give you an opportunity to vet with your water commission uh, another approach. But we should be transparent. We shouldn't turn around and come November 1st and then hit these people with so, this. One second, okay, if Mr. Clark, please. One of the things, and I've talked to a number of different communities on this, one of the things we want to avoid is there are communities that started changing their meters out five years ago, and they're 90% of the way through, but to get that last 10%, uh, they're trying to figure out just how to get that. I, I think this, again, and we need to, de to decide how to structure it, but this is the first step towards 
there's going to be a cost to you not to change the meter. Right. So. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying let's be transparent about it now. Let's not do it in November. Let's do it in June now. So everyone knows. It's, it's a very transparent way. They understand the cost st structure they want to go with. And like Mr. O'Leary stated and Mr. Schultz, their ideas, to me, encourage them to participate and get this change. Mrs. Minupelli. No, I mean, I mean, I guess if, if the smart readers are reading it daily, then you're not really doing anything differently by reading it weekly. Yeah. But I think that even if you read it weekly, the whole point of the transition to the new smart meters is for accuracy. You'd have to have a higher estimated bill sent to the customer yeah. because we can't verify accuracy with an old meter. Mm. And we know that because yeah. that's why we're transitioning to the Three smart Three good meter. ideas. You put those together, it's one really good one. I don't know. <laughs> you just say this. 50 bucks a week extra because you don't want to swap out the meter would end that real fast. In my opinion, yeah, I, I agree with you, and I agree. What it does is it also makes it problematic to try to tamper with the meter if you know somebody from the water department is so going to come in and look at that meter every week. For the week. sake of time, mm -hmm. I say I'd like to make the suggestion to the board. We set the rate as you have it drafted this evening, but I'd like to put it back on our agenda for the next meeting to bring up the fees again and give us a month. Give your opportunity. Or oh, the that. procedures. Yeah. Yeah. The procedures. The, leave the $50 yeah. in here, so yeah. the rate structure is the same. If you need to alter the procedures, the water commissioners have to make a recommendation to, to us to, to alter the procedures as to how we're going to go. How often we, with those that, are, that have been, not, been notified and are non compliant, how often are we going to read them and be subject to the special reading? Then you know, let's get their suggestion. It doesn't change the yeah. fee structure at Just all. Just a procedure. Uh, see? I knew we'd come up with something. So. We can take that action. They're going to come up with something. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yes. Good. Unless Anything you else? disagree. Uh, Andy, you don't I, like I, that I, idea? No. I think we're all in adamant <laughs> agreement that we need to do something and be more transparent about what our intentions are. I don't like <clears throat> waiting until November. I think it's disingenuous on our part. And um, we should just be honest with everyone so they can plenty of time to figure out what they want to do. So if, if that's... Good to everyone. Well, I'll take a motion. And I just would look to the water commissions to if they have any recommendations relative to the rates as well. Do you want to make a recommendation, Ben? You willing to have a summer meeting, Ben? <laughs> yes, of course. Oh, of course. Um, we voted unanimously tonight uh, to endorse um, the utility director uh, and and. TA's recommendation for a zero percent rate increase. This video for the people at home, you just state your name and sure. Yep. Vincent Ragucci, uh, 167 North Street. Thank you. Thank you, Water Commissioners, for and I think it's a great recommendation as as well to let us work something out. I also sit on the State Water Resources Commission, and what I'll do is um, I'll ask folks at DEP and um, from the uh, Mass Water Works if they have some AMI data on communities and maybe come back with a survey so you can look at yes. with some of the others because, you know, as Mark said, I, this isn't the first time something like this has come up. I appreciate it. Sure. I, I just think that being able to lay this out early in the process <coughs> gives people many months to weigh it on their end to say, Okay, if I decide to just Heisman this idea and not react to it, they take they know what the consequences are, and uh, and we move on. We're all very busy, and as you saw, that we have uh, presented a budget with some salaries in it that you're not planning on using, um, but we may end up have to using it if we go down this road and we're not compliant fully throughout the town. And I don't want to go there, but it shouldn't come at the cost of the other ratepayers that are participating. Well, the important fact is that you know, town meeting appropriated a million and a half dollars to get this project done, uh, based upon a recommendation from this board and the water commissioners and everybody else and the administration that you know this was a cost-saving uh, measure which would pay itself back in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And if we have people who are trying to beat the system and being non-compliant, you know, we need to, uh, as you say, be transparent and get the word out sooner mm -hmm. rather than later to 
uh, for some compliance, or there's going to be some serious consequences as far as uh, economic consequences as far as non-compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're going to move to close the public hearing. Or any please, you're going to ask for a public any other public input. Any yeah. Does anybody from the public like to have an input before we close the public hearing? None. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing, and I'll take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to retain the current water use rates and to amend the fees as shown in the attached schedule. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Mr. Okay. And we have one more. Yes. Mr. Chairman, just related to that, so we mentioned that there's an impact on the budget, obviously, with this new deal. Uh, with Andover being in place. So we fully expect that we'll be modifying the Water Department's fiscal year 2019 budget uh, at the October Town Meeting um, in all likelihood reducing the purchase of water expenses um, required with that. So just to give folks a heads up right now that when we're looking down the road to that, we do have an opportunity to do it before we need to get the recap signed off by DOR and we'll be recommending it at that point. At least that's the plan right now. Uh, we had another item on the agenda which was more uh, general, oh, I'm sorry, before you move on to that next item, just briefly, because you brought it up, and people are asking, the house on Mill Street, what I'd like to propose is that we allow the board the opportunity during our strategic planning session that will come up sometime around, I think, in the October time frame, right? September Roughly after the October time meeting, to give us an opportunity to discuss it, because I think we have an opportunity that we could benefit the town, and I think we just need an opportunity to have, or we can put it on the agenda, whatever the board wants to do. Um, I don't think we're in any rush. I think the house is safe, and I think you're maintaining it. And but if you feel there's an urgency there, if we can wait until our strategic planning session, I would like to do that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that we have a parallel course that we're running, which is part of the next agenda item, um, providing the update on the permitting process. So while all the, in, all of the steps that are within the two communities' control have been addressed, we have the permitting that will be subject to as well, which we'll be going through. So. Um, I don't think we would want to make any final decisions until that's actually been resolved, but we hope that will be quick, okay. relatively speaking. Good. You know, so, so waiting for so that. So I think we're okay. Um, you know, obviously, uh, we, there is a cost associated with it. We are maintaining that property to keep it in, in, uh, in, in good shape, but uh, we should definitely look to do it in the earlier part of the fall. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Excuse me. Excuse me. We have another matter before us as far as stage, staging our water use restrictions. Correct. Mr. Yes. Chairman, through you, we... Uh, Modify the agenda to add consideration of the water use uh, restrictions to vote to approve a stage one restriction. Uh, we were up until um, we, we have been under our seasonal restrictions, which are basically calling for odd, even outdoor watering. Uh, to go to the stage one restriction, which Mr. Clark has up there, is uh, <coughs> twice a week based on your uh, address with odd numbers, <coughs> numbered lawns Plus. being able to be watered between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. on Tuesday and Friday and even numbered addresses to be watered uh, on Wednesday and Saturday uh, between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. We've asked the board to take that vote. Um, true to what normally happens, it's a bit of a, a rain dance for us, as you will, and I, I think we all heard the rain out there. Whenever we start talking about this, it does rain. <laughs> this is really more proactive. <laughs> yeah. It's really attempted to, an attempt to be proactive to uh, avoid a, a more strict uh, requirement down the road in the season. Again, it's all subject to what Mother Nature gives us, but we're asking the board to approve the water use restriction this evening. Okay. I just, if I could just chime in, the, uh, historically this is something that comes on us very quickly. Uh, a week ago Sunday our tanks were full, the, the connections with Andover shut off because they were satisfied, and here we are eight days later and we're asking for, for restrictions just because it's that quick in North Reading. Um, I will agree with the town administrator. I think this is the third time I've been in front of you guys asking for a restriction increase and the thunderstorms come through right as you know, we were discussing <laughs> it. So maybe we should do this more often. But, uh, it, you know, Vinny supplied this. This is, a, and I know you can't really see it, but that's the state and that's the condition. And the, what it's showing is the precipitation in uh, May. And the whole state is in a, a basically a, a very low precipitation stage. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's a darker red that kind of comes over and encompasses North Reading. Um, that we're in a very low, we were in a, a 25 to 50 percent of the average rainfall for the month of May. So again, it's a, a for us it very much is a precipitation driven uh, condition and uh, 
I think almost every summer I've been in front of you at some point asking for this restriction. It may rain tonight, which may pu push the issue off a week or so, but uh, where we are is our sources are tired. They're, they're not able to produce what they once did, and we don't have the, uh, the ability to take more water from Andover until we get those permits in place. So um, that's really kind of the driver here. Thank you. Mr. Just a quick question, uh, Ms. Clark. I'm just curious why, like, um, even numbers are Wednesday and Saturday. Was there a reason why we picked two particular days of the week? Does it make sense more to spread that out for water usage purposes? So I will say this, the one complaint I get about the, uh, this particular restriction, that it's Wednesday and Saturday and people that go away for the weekend aren't there Saturday. There are certain people that only will run their sprinkler system by hand and they will not just let it be automated. And one gentleman calls me every year and says we should consider changing that to different days of the week. Typically, what, why we don't water on Saturday and Sunday, North Reading's a little odd. It's very much a bedroom community, and the highest water demand days are Saturday and even more so on Sunday. So people that go away from the weekend come home Sunday evening. We have killer water demands in this town. Uh, you would think that, okay, industry, you know, Monday to Friday is driving the water use. We have no sewer, so we have no huge water using industry. So we want to avoid Monday, we're trying to recover, which is why the Tuesday and Friday, and then the Wednesday and Saturday, we're just offsetting that one day. Uh, Makes sense. Laundry. Laundry. <laughs> okay. Take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to declare a stage one water use restriction. Second. second. Uh, motion is second by Mrs. Mignapelli. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Right. That brings us to the <laughs> special municipal employee disclosure. Well, I think no, we were going to get an update on the waste uh, on the permitting. Did I miss something? Yeah, there was one item before the hearing, but we oh, weren't able yeah, to yeah, get yeah, to yeah. it. Water so wastewater update. I, I've asked uh, Mr. Clark just to provide the briefest of updates relative to the permitting. I know the hour is much later than we may have expected it to be. Commissioners, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Clark, if I could ask you just a quick update. Sure, and I'll be very, very quick. So the very top third of this is just the status of the 99-year IMA. We're there. Um, the last bullet of this was considered by the Andover Board of Selectmen on June 18th. Obviously, they passed that five to nothing tonight. So that 99-year agreement is effectively in place. Uh, in terms of permitting and design, uh, what kind of kicked us into the whole Andover discussion was we had submitted a draft environmental impact report to the state. Uh, they submit and over submitted comments back to that which opened the discussion we were in uh, we were on the path of going developing our final impact EIR um, that is partially done at this point we basically put that on hold until we decided where we were going to be with and over um, so we have to file a notice of project change what our drafts report said we were going to go to MWRA for our water so we're changing that to and over as the water supplier um, we're currently looking to continue to proceed with both the water and the wastewater end of this FEIR. Uh, we have discussed in the past that at some point those two projects may divide off and go their own time paths, but at, at this time we're going to try to push that and the state has actually encouraged us to kind of keep them together as far as we can. Um, second permit we've talked about a bit is the Interbasin Transfer Act permit. Um, current permit from 1991 is a million and a half gallons per day. We're going to seek a permit with a volume of three million gallons a day. Uh, and my understanding is the FEIR application actually serves as the interbasin transfer action a application permit as well. So they're kind of on a parallel path. Once the FEIR is done, we'll submit it to the state and we'll also submit it to the Water Resources Commission. Um, then, kind of excuse me, Mark, just, just on the uh, uh, seeking a permit for volume of 3.0, uh, I thought we were looking at 2.6 and then later 3.0. Something's changed through that discussion? So, so the int we have to be able to justify the volume we're looking for. So if we're only able to justify 2.6, that's the volume we're absolutely going to, or we're at, in the end going to have to apply for. So we need our engineers to look at that really long and hard. Again, during the process, we ask them to go back and take a look at what are the impacts of sewer. We've had the, the Pulte development come on. So there were a couple things that weren't really on the table when the draft report was, was prepared. Um, the 3.0 is, is kind of the, the top end number that we're going right. to be looking uh, for. Right. Just for the rest of the board's information, we, we were dealing with the Andover. You know, we're requiring them to provide us up to 3 million gallons. Right. Uh, they were insisted upon us applying for the 3 million gallon permit 
but we may, may not be able to justify that. So there is nothing in our agreement, the uh, 99 year agreement at this point, for permitting on our part other than the 2.6, my understanding is. Because that's what we can justify today. But without the sewerage, we can't go to 3.0 and they can't sell it to us. They don't become our sole provider until they can provide us 3.0. So there's the tie-in with the, with the sewerage and the justification uh, model, so. Mr. Messier. Yeah, I think they encourage us to, for the three because they're gonna make an investment in both in uh, permitting for additional water from the Merrimack and some infrastructure improvements. So to me, there is no need to separate them anymore. We should stay the path. And that is the intent to stay the path as right. far as we can. Well, and the other benefit of that is if if the sewer FEI end of the FEIR is incorporated, that actually can drive down the interbasin transfer permit number because we're taking that water from the Merrimack River Basin. If we go to Greater Lawrence and discharge it back, that's a net reduction in the interbasin. It, it, it's kind of sewer is subtracted out of that flow. So, so you know, I want to make sure, uh, Michael, is from your budgeting standpoint, did you budget money in there? Because at some point we were thinking about switching them off. What path did you use in your budget this year? Because it's different engineering costs and studies, right? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we have enough money. If we, now we're going to keep it together, do we have the money to get us to FY18, uh, 19? So, and I, and I don't have the benefit of the uh, calculations in front of me, but we had unexpended funding from fiscal years, I believe 2016 and 2017 for water and wastewater permitting, which we'll end up going back to to utilize. Um, part of it relates to what you saw take place at the beginning of the meeting with the permitting. We, we did not have the borrowing approved, so we were being billed for these, for the, for these amounts against um, these initial MWRA water and wastewater appropriations. We, we're going to actually charge those costs where they belong, which is against the Andover appropriation approved at the October town meeting. That should free up dollars previously authorized. Uh, for permitting for FEIR, both for water and for wastewater. I want to say it was 150 for wastewater, and I don't remember for water. So there's 150 approved for wastewater, 150 approved for water. Today we've expended 57,000 of wastewater and 62,000 on the water. Um, so we have almost $90,000 on both sides of the table. Um, what we have unencumbered is, is significant on both. So we feel we have sufficient funds to go forward. Uh, we also do have some money in the Interbasin Transfer Act permit uh, kitty as well. So I, I think at this point we're in good financial shape on, on those permitting ends of it. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Mr. Messier? One, uh, one last thing related to water. Are we planning on having a joint meeting with Andover as sort of a formal acknowledgement of the agreement that both parties have already signed? Uh, so I believe the intention is, is yes to do so. I've expressed our desire to do so um, by a text message with the town manager. Um, we'll let the board know more about that. Uh, I don't think it'll be this week. I think there'll be some lead time for it. But uh, we do expect to have such a signing, yes. There'll be a big picture of water with a smiley face on it. And a slip and slide. <laughs> <laughs> and a slip and slide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Like Kool -Aid. I'll take a motion. So what is the motion? We don't need a motion. This was just an update. We don't need a motion. Beautiful. And, you, and with that, I'd like to, if we can move some things around the agenda to allow the RMLD folks to go so they don't have to wait. Oh, wait a minute. Are you here for saying? Let's, let's do that next. Unless anyone has an objection. We don't have to wait around any longer. Thank you for waiting as long as you did. So we're going to talk about we're going to meet with MR, MR, RMLD and the pilot Hello, agreement for energy here, source store. Right there. Please pull up some more chairs, what you need. Just if you could, Tom, uh, introduce yourself for the community listening at home. And Do you have my slides, Mike? I have it as a PDF. Okay. That's fine. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Tom Olala. I'm a, an engineer with uh, RMLD. I'm here tonight to give you a, a brief overview of a new project that we're starting this year. 
um, that's going, that's an energy storage project that will be located at our North Reading substation. Um, I'm an engineer at RMLD and one of my functions is to act as the uh, key account manager for the town. So any issues between the town and the light department, I help coordinate those projects and work with the school department at the DPW, et cetera, to resolve those issues. I am also uh, happen to be project manager for this new project that's just starting this year. So it is appropriate that I come before you tonight to answer, give you a, a brief overview and answer any questions you might have on the project. Um, however, um, I'm sure you've met Colleen O'Brien, our general manager, in the past. And uh, she would be glad to speak with you or meet with you directly if that's required at some point in the future if you have other issues that I'm not able to address or you have other, other concerns on a, on a higher level. So uh, with that, um, also joining me today is uh, Neil Watlington, who's our, our strategic partner for us on this project. And I'll, I'll explain, he's with a company called Nextera. So they're actually going to be the owner and operator of this system. <clears throat> the last name again? Washington. Washington with a TL. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, Debbie, you know, I'm sure from the town, um, is going to uh, address uh, some specific issues on the uh, proposed pilot agreement. So um, the project we're talking about is uh, a, new, a new phase of a longer term strategic initiative that RMLD has been uh, assembling for a number of years and will continue into the future. Uh, and it's really a way for us to help mitigate our costs and keep our rates as low as possible and uh, also to, uh, at the same time, increase r the reliability and the, uh, the cleanliness, the, uh, the overall efficiency of our system. <clears throat> so this is uh, the second major phase in this strategic initiative. Last year, we added a engine generator at the site, which is used on peak days, like today. Today was actually a very high electric demand day. Um, uh, so on those days when rates are very expensive uh, during those peak hours, it, it's a very effective way for us to uh, reduce our cost levels. Unfortunately, as we're a, a power distributor, we don't uh, generate our own power uh, per se. So any power we buy from the power generators, the nuclear power stations, Hydro Quebec, et cetera, those costs are pretty much just a pass through for us. So we take that power in, we sell it to our customers, and that is just a complete pass-through. So probably 70 or 80 percent of our costs, we have really no control over. So this is one area, if we can manage our peak loads, do a better job of managing our efficiencies and our peak loads, it's an effective way for us to have some input on controlling our costs, and those savings get passed along to all of our ratepayers the citizens of North Reading and our three other towns that we serve as well. So uh, specifically, um, what we do uh, as far as what's called um, peak shaving or our internal marketing name is Shred the Peak. I'm sure you've seen uh, email uh, alerts from us. You might be getting sick of receiving them by now. But uh, the, uh, the goal is if you look at the, uh, the diagram here, a lot of the rates that we have to pay are, t are pegged to what our usage is at those highest demand times. In fact, the peak hour for all of ISO New England was this afternoon from 5 to 7 p 6 p.m., 5 to 6 p.m. So uh, what those rates are actually impact fees that we'll pay on our customers' behalf for the whole next year. So that's how dramatic those summer peaks are. So if we can uh, reduce the amount of total power used by our customers during that one hour, it can be significant savings. So one way to do that is to, instead of buying power from the power plants during those hours, we generate our own power, whether that's solar panels that are located in our territory or an engine generator like we have now at, North Steady, uh, at, at the North Reading substation. So we, this afternoon, we ran that generator for four hours to cover that peak, and in doing so, we saved you know, a significant amount of money. 
So the project I'm talking to you about tonight is a, uh, a, it's a very large battery. It's based on lithium ion battery cells, similar to what you'd find in an electric vehicle. If you bought a Tesla or a Chevy Bolt or a, an electric vehicle, it has lithium ion battery packs in there that uh, provide energy to the motors that make the car go. This project is, you know, very large storage containers of those batteries at our substation that we charge up at night when the rates are low and then discharge and went during these peak periods. So if that battery, uh, the energy storage project was up and running today, this afternoon, it would have been discharging during that five to six hour time. So um, uh, the bat cost of these battery systems have been coming down significantly over the past few years, but it's still not a complete no-brainer that you, you buy them and it saves you a ton of money. So um, there are a few things which mitigated those expenses for us. One was we were fortunate enough to be awarded a, a grant from the state to offset some of those charges for this particular project. So, so that was very helpful. Um, the other concern for us is typically we would buy this equipment, um, like the generator that we installed last year, that was a straight capital purchase. However, because these uh, battery technology is still relatively new, there's technology risk there, that this is a 20-year project, and if we bought, if RMLD went out in a straight capital purchase, you know, there's risk that what if those batteries only last five years, then, you know, is it really worth it? So to mitigate that, instead of a straight capital purchase, this program was set up as a uh, pay for service arrangement. So Nextera, our partner on this project, they're actually going to design and own the equipment that's installed at our um, substation as part of a 20-year long-term uh, contract. So it's essentially a uh, pay for service uh, contract, similar to a solar system that, you know, a solar developer would own those panels and then we just buy the power from them. So in this case, we're buying the power coming out of those batteries during the hours uh, when prices are high. So even after paying Nextera to do that work, we, uh, looking at the projections for this project, we will save the uh, system on the order of $150,000 a year over you know, the, the uh, first 10 years of the project. Um, it's a 20-year agreement, long-term agreement, and it also mitigates the risk for us and our ratepayers that because we don't own the capital, it's up to, you know, Nextera, the operator, if the batteries die after five years, they have to replace them and keep the system outputting at its max rating. So, yes, Mr. Masseri? Well, what is the efficiency? You know, there's a loss associated with taking AC, converting it into DC for the batteries, and then the reverse. Yes, to get that, it back to yeah, AC. that's that's a good what point. What is the technology? It, it's it's, uh, it's a good point. It's it's not a hundred percent efficient. So well, if you <laughs> if you if you put in a hundred kilowatt hours, you might get out eighty or ninety. So it's about a ten percent or so round trip uh, conversion uh, um, loss that you have to eat. Um, so you could one way to look at that is that that loss is the quote, fuel. So for a, an engine generator like we have now, we have to buy natural gas to feed into that engine to run to generate yeah. power. So that those conversion are the fuel for this one. So those costs are, are factored into this saving. So those are all part of the operating system that we're paying for. So uh, bottom line is by doing this project, uh, the, the primary benefit to our system and our ratepayers is the cost savings. But as I'll get into, there's uh, three or four other additional benefits to that, if you want to go ahead, Michael. Um, the second is a, a significant reduction in carbon footprint. Excuse me, Tom. Yep. I apologize. Mr. Just Schultz, I a follow-up yeah. to Mr. Sure. Serious question. In a peak situation like today, how long would the batteries help us? Um, it, it's the, uh, the fees are established during that one peak hour. So in a perfect world, you only have to run for that one hour. But because it's a forecast, it's the highest hour for the whole year. 
So you don't know when that is until the whole year. Well, how long could you run the batteries for? The, the plan is that the batteries will be dispatched or operated for three hours per running day in the summer and two hours in the winter. And then conversely, so how long would it take to recharge those batteries if you were about the same time? About okay, the same so you can use them the next day if there was another if there was a heat. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if tomorrow was another potential peak day, tonight or tomorrow morning, we would recharge the batteries, and then they would be ready to go again for tomorrow's peak. Okay. Thank you. So right. Just, just good question. What do you have yeah. in your uh, your contract, uh, with this gentleman over here, as far as you? Know, I assume there's some sort of an advantage for them to, to keep up with the technology, but how can you force the efficiencies to realize the savings? You know, at some point, if the system, this system is failing, you know, you're still locked in. How, how do you maintain? Uh, well, you, said, oh, you said you know, $150,000 a year for, for 10 years. You know, what about the other 10 years? You know, what have you worked into the contract? The, contra to the contract requires uh, meeting performance levels. Mm -hmm. So the, the performance, the output that we're expecting on day one, you know, within a small tolerance band, that's guaranteed over the full 20 years. So in year seven, if they have to put in additional batteries to maintain that performance level, then, then that's on them. They'll, they'll go ahead and do that. So, so it's a it's a performance guarantee. Right. I'm good. Whereas if we if we bought it outright and we owned it, that would be a cost we'd have to absorb at some point. Is you know buy buy more but batteries. In the case of a default, I mean, it's obviously there's a savings to it, so you just don't realize the savings. There's no additional exposure for RMLD. Correct. You know, if they go belly up on the technology isn't worth their while to invest in any longer right and they walk away you know is there a penalty associated with their not meeting standards yes yeah those uh those guarantees are built into the contract that we're you know in the in the process of negotiating now so there's all kinds of legal performance uh, stipulations in there okay Good. so thank you yep uh, can a solar cell setup also feed this yeah, that's certainly possible that you could combine these batteries with an existing solar system to have, you know, f fully green or renewable power. And, and many uh, of the other projects that, you know, I mentioned the, the state grant, uh, many of those additional projects are tied with solar development. So you can do it either way. But, but for our project, it, it made most sense just to do it as a straight grid recharge and to, to uh, save money on the uh, capacity and transmission fees. Okay, so um, the, one of the other major benefits is the, uh, the more renewable uh, improvements on that, that by reducing our peaks during those critical hours, it really improves the total carbon uh, footprint of the whole ISO uh, electric grid because what happens is the higher that demand gets when all of New England is running at full tilt, the more, quote, dirtier power plants come online. Uh, so uh, there's, we do still have some power plants that are powered by fuel oil, but those are only operated when we really need them at that last five or ten percent of load so by doing things uh, that you can do to manage your load better re either reducing your load or generating through other means it prevents you know it makes it so you don't have to operate those. so it becomes a net benefit so that's why the state is very uh, proactive in, in awarding and awarding these grants to encourage these kind of you know uh, renewable projects the second area which is a major long-term benefit is from a re reliability and resiliency point of view that in the uh, unlikely event of a long-term outage because all of our power comes to us from National Grid for this substation so if there was some catastrophe in a hurricane took out National Grid's you know complete line feeding us that substation would, would be completely shut down and if it looked like that was going to be more than a few days or a week, we, we would have no way to supply any load to all of the customers from the North Reading substation. So uh, by having the battery there in conjunction with the existing engine generator, 
that could be set up as a small, what's called a microgrid, to provide load to, we couldn't supply, uh, completely replace all the power we lost, but we could power, say, one or two feeders and provide local emergency service to maybe power the fire station, the police station, and the high school or something. So it's a nice asset for us and the town to have in such a catastrophic uh, scenario. And as part of the grant, we will be doing a formal study next year to show exactly how we would go about doing that. So it's, it's, a, it's a real you know, important resiliency. And I know the town's involved in doing resiliency planning, and this is a, a typical project that would go along with it. And then the, the last specific thing that's a benefit to the town is many of these systems have associated uh, pilot or tax payments to the, the local town, the property owner. So as part of this project, um, we're uh, working with, with Debbie and her group and with the town administrator to work out a, uh, a pilot agreement with the town of, Net of North Reading, which is, uh, you know, what we're talking about is $10,000 a year for the full 20 years of the project. So you know, $200,000 over the life of the project. Um, so we'll, uh, I think Debbie's going to say a few words about that specifically on, on that process. We're just working with the town to figure out what we need to do to, to do this. And I, I believe a town meeting vote is required, so we're, we're preparing for that. Um, and the last slide, Michael, Can is... Can I just uh, ask about that? Yeah, go right ahead. Yes. What, what would, it's the, in the pilot, what would we normally be accepting for taxes that we would be doing this pilot in exchange well uh, one thing is if if uh, RMLD had bought this as a capital purchase we're non taxable so there would be no there would be no impact at all but the fact that we're doing this for risk mitigation uh, reasons it it is owned by Nextera so it could be argued that you know they're a taxable entity like a solar uh, array privately owned would be so um, it would be subject to attack. So that's why we developed this proposal to do it as a pilot to make sure it's fixed so that benefits the town that it's a defined amount for the entire project and not a depreciating uh, amount. And the $10,000 was established in looking at uh, some similar energy storage projects in Western Mass that have been done recently. So it's you know about the same range. You know, unfortunately, there's not a lot of market data, like solar panels, it, you know, there's an established market price there, but for this, it's still new. So we, we're in the process of working with, with Michael and, and Debbie to, to uh, determine exactly what that uh, legal document has to be. So Tom, the area this is going in is to the left of the generator, correct? Yeah, uh, if you go up to the side, that green lawn area in the corner of our, so it's all within our existing property line. So the, the, uh, the generator, you can see the white arrow. So this uh, system will be right adjacent to that. So it's another like roughly 100 foot square uh, fenced in area that will uh, be the battery equipment. So you're gonna tear up all that grass? Yes. And you're putting down stone and then a yeah it will be crushed gravel like uh, like there is under the generator and then if you go to the next slide Mike that's a, a rough uh, out, outline of the different uh, what, what it is is a series of prefabricated enclosures that will essentially just be dropped in place mm -hmm. and then uh, wired through conduits to the substation. So the whole footprint's 125 by 115? Yes, yeah, the entire, and that's all within our existing fenced area. So this is a 20-year project? Correct. Just North Reading, you, you gotta be doing more towns than just North Reading. So well, you know, our hope there's, is... There's no, there's really no benefit to just do one town. Well, our hope is this is the first uh, energy storage project, and we'll be, there'll be additional projects to follow on from that. And, you know, our longer term goal for um, load management, uh, our, our peak load in the summer is around 150 megawatts. Our goal is to have on the order of 20 megawatts worth of load reduction capability. So the generator we installed was two and a half megawatts. This is five, so we're almost halfway to our goal with these two projects. 
So there will be additional uh, projects, assuming all this works out well. And, and what we'll do is spread them around to the other substations or other areas in our territory. So 20 years goes by. <clears throat> You're all done with this project. Mm. You just lift these structures up, you take them away? Or? Yeah, as part of the, uh, the contract, that is uh, written into there that there's, a, uh, there's an option. We have the option of buying the assets at that point at fair market value, whatever that is. Or we could say, no, we don't want it, and next day is responsible to take those, that product away and put the site back basically to its original condition. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Masseri, then Mr. Minipel. So one of, the, one of the concerns that pops up to me is a 20-year, the length of the, uh, the contract or whatever you're right. in the process of negotiating. It was the rate of change of technology you know, continually increases. 20 years is a long time. And there'll be other things that come along in the, to replace this particular approach. Yeah, that's, that's certainly uh, very possible. But say, you know, that's one advantage why these battery systems are very modular. So they're essentially large cabinets that the batteries slide into and out of. So Nextera could make the you know, decision at year 11 that, geez, I can put in these cheaper batteries and get more performance and you know, s save money for them as well. So that, that's always an option. And that would be true whether we bought it right. or, or they bought it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true when, when you buy any product. You buy a new car, there could be a better car out in five years. So, so yeah, it's a good point. But um, even if if this performance stays exactly as is, it's still beneficial for that full 20 years. Yeah. So, Kate. Okay. Uh, how did you land with Nextera for this technology? Are there other providers that, that sell this? And why yes, you they, yeah, there's like any um, technical uh, supplier, there, um, there's many of developers out there. Nextera happens to be one of the largest. In fact, they're at, and actually a utility, or one of the largest utilities. It's, um, their largest division is actually Florida Power and Light. So they provide the power for, is it all of Florida or? No, it's not, it's not all of Florida, but all of right. Southern Florida. So, and they, because this is a new technology, they were one of the leaders in it, and they already have 60 megawatts of these things deployed around the country. And, and the, uh, the ACES grant, the state grant, was a very involved process. That was a, a one-year project just to do the grant application. So it required us to pick our supplier up front as opposed to doing a formal RFP process. So we did a you know, four or five month review of talking to different developers and they seemed to be the right fit for what we were looking for. And they helped out quite a bit on that um, process. So what do you need from us tonight? Um, it, I think primarily is to get your and make you aware of the project and to work with the town administrator and with Debbie's group to um, uh, review and agree on the pilot agreement. So we've we've given uh, our Nextera the actually the pilot agreement is between Nextera and the town. So Debbie will be working with Neil to work out the details. It's a five to ten page legal document that um, they'll agree on the terms to, and then, well actually maybe that's a good segue that you could talk about the process on how, how would that work. And how many towns are doing it, if you could let us know as well, have already done this, if, or are we the first? With, are you referring to the battery storage, Mike, or solar in general? This project. The are we the first ones? Well, there, uh, we, we do have, uh, there's one project in Holyoke that had an existing pilot agreement for a solar facility. Last year they added a battery project to it and they amended their pilot agreement to increase the amount to cover the, the value of the battery. So that number gave us a bogey that gave us, uh, you know. A, that's where I was going. Okay. Right, so that's how we came up with the $10,000. What's, what was the, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, what's the, the capital investment that Nextera is making here for a 20-year period? 
It's uh, several yeah. million dollars. It'll be a little bit less. Yeah. Around the range of five million dollars or something like that. All right, so you've got five million dollars worth of assets that you're placing here. Yeah, I mean, that, that includes construction costs. You know, the, it's not all uh, equipment. Right? The construction costs. Maintenance. Not, maintenance. The cost of capital that will go into the project. This couple, please. If you could so just take the mic, Martin, would you? So the folks at home could hear you. That would be great. So, with working with Tom and um, Next Era on this project, as far as assessing what we're going to be looking at, is going over the contract, making sure that it's suitable for the community, and also the the dollar amount. I mean, we've had a slight conversation tonight none of it's etched in stone the biggest thing that we need to do is get all of our information together obviously they'll go to town council they'll will be back before you again with the final information but it has to be approved at local at the local level so in October is what we would be looking at for the presentation and acceptance if the town chooses to go with us um, as Tom alluded to he's they're exempt property so where the contracts going to be between next hour in the town that's our only source of any kind of revenue that we could get. Yeah. Uh, with that being said, we uh, we would have to have it yeah. okay to tell me. It just meeting. seems a little odd. Don't, don't take this wrong, mm -hmm. Tom, please. But you're going to get three million dollars out of this deal, right? Twenty years. Well, one hundred fifty thousand. One hundred fifty thousand. Well, the the ratepayers will will uh, accrue that savings right through the system. So. Well, I'm not sure about that. Right. I mean, that's not the way it was worked. Yes, the the bottom line savings to the RMLB system is one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So that gets passed along in either credits or lower rates to our customers. Mrs. Ben, you probably then still there. But isn't the because it it's not their equipment and their they have a lease arrangement with a provider that isn't that what you would be assessing the um, tax on for next year the the value of what they're paying to lease it or rent it or whatever their arrangement is. Isn't that there how you would come up with it? There are many different avenues, and, and each project takes on somewhat a life of its own. We actually just signed one a few months ago in Middleton. It's not the battery. It's actually a solar farm. Uh, so that, uh, you know, with that being said, it, it takes a couple of months to get there. But to answer your question, yes. That is how the solar farm in Middleton, we did assess it. We took the total value of the cost, the all-in number. But you still have to apply what's called the depreciation factor on there because, as Mr. Masiri said, this outdates itself, you know, pretty rapidly. Can you boost it up and replace it? Of course you can, but you do have to apply the depreciation. So that's what we did. We had the all-in cost and uh, used the depreciation factor, and that is on a pilot program also. I, but I mean on the solar panels, in other words? Is that what you mean? Yes. Not for there. this transaction. For RMLB, <coughs> it's battery the solar battery. The one I was explaining to you as far as how the value was just done in Middleton is a solar farm, so that's panels. Mm -hmm. They're they're pretty similar in the same use. Um, short course, can answer that a lot better than I could. 
But at the end of the day, they serve the same purpose. They're trying to, you know, take the ratepayers and, and give them a little bit of an advantage. As far as the numbers that we're seeing tonight, I don't really want us to get hung up on that because we really haven't had an opportunity to discuss where any of it's coming, you know, the process that we plan on taking for final numbers. We're not here tonight for final numbers. We're here tonight so that you are aware that, you know, this is in negotiations and could it be something that it is a benefit to the town? Yeah. Okay. So that's that's our purpose in being here tonight. Not with a final, you know, draft project that's and say, you know, know, this is what yes. it's but, gonna be. But what we are talking about is sort of <coughs> disrupting an area in town to install this. For ten thousand dollars a year, uh -huh. and then we have to, we got to make sure. My biggest concern is to make sure that after twenty years, mm -hmm. that, that somebody's on the hook to report it back to its original state. Yeah, that that is. And it shouldn't come out of us. Right. No, that's uh, between RMLD and Nextera. That when the project is over, that property will be returned back to its original state. That's, so that's when you look already at decided. ten thousand dollars a year for that property, and how big of an area is that? Mm -hmm. 125 yeah, 10,000 10, 10, square feet. 10,000 10, square feet. You know, are we, is that, are we, is there better ideas that we can use to gain more than $10,000? Because this is the first time this has come up in this area. No, this, is, this is RMLD property. It's not town property. Then why are we, the, why are we getting a pilot? Because, why are we because a pilot? RMLD, which is a nonprofit, is engaging right. in a there contract with a profit making organization, so therefore they may not be tax exempt. Right. So this is a payment in lieu of taxes. Exactly. But, uh, but I think when you're presenting it, not just to us, but to, to people that have to vote to say yes, it says payment in lieu of taxes. It begs the question what exactly would we be, what would you be factoring as the tax? adding in those added benefits obviously gives the impetus to enter the pilot but people are going to ask that how would you oh. normally be assessing this equipment and this lease agreement in factoring depreciation which you have a finite 20-year period right. to do that they're going to want to know what could we be receiving and why are we entering this and is it something you know worthy of considering because of all the reasons that you just explained, right. that passing yeah, along we, the benefits. We feel there's, not. you know, the four or five major benefits to the to the town, yeah. the citizens, and the broader RMLD system. Mm -hmm. So we, we think it's well worth while. But you know, we, we, want, we need alone to make sure that, that you, the board, and the, the town is is you know supportive of that, and you understand it. And yeah, we, we'd be glad to. So, so basically, in terms of the uh, cost reduction, it goes across to all users of Reading Municipal Light. The rates, the fact Correct. that it's being installed here and yeah, not we, Reading, we, yeah, we did, it, we if it was being installed in Reading instead, right. right, you wouldn't be here talking to us tonight, correct? Correct, because there they would be the taxable entity of that right. property but right. but you're right the rmld system serves all customers right. so yeah. that hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars does get spread around to the entire it's not only benefiting correct north red yeah. and and you know yeah. unfortunately it's not as huge a savings as we'd like i mean one hundred fifty thousand is good but it's it's not going to eliminate anyone's electric bill it, in fact if you spread it out across all our 26,000 residents, they save $6 a year. So, you know, it's a good first step and it's one of the few things that we have control over. So we want to expand on that, but. Well, if everybody put a bunch of batteries and then leveled off the generation, you know, in other words, averaged out the power. Yeah, across absolutely. The whole Absolutely. That, that's State. the direction. I mean, that's as that's good the as you direction can get. we want to go. Absolutely. That's great. But you know, it's like any capital investment. Somebody has to come up with that money. 
And you know, to save six dollars a year, are you going to spend a thousand dollars? Probably not. Mr. Miss Harry and Mr. O'Leary. Um, will you be sharing the contract uh, details with the assessors and the town administrator as far as you know what the capital investments are going to be and how you know so that a, yeah, we've been a proper through, valuation we've been going will be the uh, you know the economic model as I said just the, putting this project together took a year to look at all of the you right. know, the economic trade-offs right. so we'd be glad to discuss that with the town but um, you know with with the next era folks as well so so yeah, we need, as Ed said, unfortunately, we had hoped to, by the time we got in front of you, to have a final document to have you approve, but we're not quite there yet. No. Okay. No, okay. And then the, um, um, does Nextera uh, invest in solar also? Or is it? Yeah, we're, we're the largest uh, wind, solar, and energy storage developer operating mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, because we have some other property that's of not being put to much use at this particular point in time, <laughs> uh, just off the Ipswich River, about a mile away from where you are right now, um, you know, the formerly known as the Smith property, uh, which may be a good candidate for some discussion to, for, uh, to augment. For solar, yeah, I'd be glad to talk to, you, to the town about that. We, we discussed it a couple of years ago and-, and But do I, I don't know what it would take to get the energy, again, I'm not that familiar with yeah. it, you know, from, you know, Route 62 further down the road, you know, to augment this, uh, but again, uh, you know, for a uh, short or even long-term lease agreement to put it to some use, and where we'd have a revenue stream to provide some access to it, um, maybe yeah. a good return on our investment at some point. Well, it's 50 acres, and about 25 acres of it's pretty usable, yeah. but there's no access right now. Yeah. And it's pretty flat. Yeah, it is. It's actually beautiful. I walked it. Lots of sun. Uh, lots of sun. Lots of sun. Yeah, uh, and, and as I mentioned, this is all part of a long-term strategic plan to go in this direction. So this is and one And again, project we're partnering with RMLD or partnering with your well, partner, um, you know, is something that we should be putting yeah, on, that's the, on the front burner also uh, for uh, discussion and maybe as part of this project, you know, as an augmentation to it. And again, I don't know how quickly we can get someone to, to take a look at it and check out the feas feasibility. Um, and, um, one complicating factor in that is the state is in the process of completely reconfiguring the solar uh, renewable energy credits. So that changes the economics quite a bit and that quite, hasn't quite resolved itself yet. Yeah, Vinny's So, uh, so uh, uh, Vinny's been, uh, and it, the company he works for is quite involved in that process. So is that, you know, straightens itself out over the next six to 12 months. We could certainly look at projects like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schultz. Um, just real quick while we have your totally off topic, but I've had a couple of seniors in town um, had concerns about the brightness of the new LED street lights. Is there anything that can be done about that or? Uh, the, uh, the lights, uh, there's a, a couple of different model numbers that we use. One of them has the option to put a deflector on it, like a little sh shade or a shield. So in some of them, that can help situations like that. Okay. The others, sometimes we can redirect them, either change the angle or, uh, but it, it's, but the not, brightness it's not a dimmer yeah. switch on them, no. Is that kind of a light by light? Yeah, it really has to go case by case. So if a resident has an issue, they should call you yeah. guys? In fact, Danielle um, sent me a request uh, for uh, a light like that within the last couple of weeks. So, okay. Yeah. You okay. Know, those, those things I can help Great. You know, individuals or you folks with. And, and again, excuse me, the, the payment uh, in lieu of taxes will be, uh, the agreement will be between, between, between Nextera, Nextera, and Nextera and the, and the town, town of Northrend. Right actually, the project is going to be called Minuteman uh, Energy Storage because they create a, a sole purpose entity for the project. So the agreement will be between Minuteman and the town of North Reading. Okay. I'm just not, I, I'm just not sure on the payback. I mean, you're talking about several million dollars. I don't know well, how you, the, they get the payback. Yeah. Uh, pay, payback, whose payback? But for RMLD or? Payback well, what? Well, we're what only getting we 10,000. 
what we need to be cognizant of is the fact that RMLD is already exempt property. So in that number, let's not get stuck on that $10,000 that we saw on the screen tonight because we are in negotiations with this. Will it go up? I can't, I can't promise you that. I don't know. We've, we're just getting to this contract and the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. So I'm just trying to understand it because I'm mm -hmm. a numbers person. I look at it. Right, it, right. And it, I get I respect just, that. Know, Absolutely. The customer's gonna save thirty one dollars a year. We're gonna get ten thousand dollars. I don't know. I'm not like wowed, but you know, I, I right, the I, slide that you had the three bullets on, you know, the res resiliency and all yeah, that stuff. It's redundancy. support redundancy as well. I I get it. Makes sense to me, but and another another driving sure. factor, another driving factor, Mike, is the state is really proactive on pushing these, and they're really encouraging us to do it by investing in this. So, what's the goal we, then? Why are they doing? What's the, what's the ultimate the, goal? What are we the trying goal to achieve? Is, the goal? goal is the reliability and long-term viability of the power grid. So they want uh, all of us to be investing in renewable things that are going to be here for the long term and improve on our resiliency. So as storms come up and go, it, the system can be more self-healing. And if this side gets wiped out, it can still manage to operate through batteries or generators or, wh or whatever system. So resiliency is a big driving factor for this. Yes. But I also think, I mean, just entering the pilot would be for those, those are really unascertainable values that you can't really strictly put a formula on like you would normally by assessing other properties. Exactly. So that, that's really, that's really the impetus to us entering into this. But, you know, you, it might not be that straightforward formula right. that we all and, and that, would that's expect. another reason why it, it's a... It, no pun intended, but it's a pilot program yes, that, yeah. you know, two years or five years from now, it'll hopefully be much more established. Mm -hmm. And when we mm -hmm. do our second, third, and fifth system, we'll maybe have a, a formal policy and know right. exactly how it will be yeah, charged. We're, we're locked in for 20 years, or Mr. Mr. O'Leary. Go ahead. Yeah. I can tell you the town currently has other pilot programs that we do um, have in place already. Yep. And those are sent out, you know, in the month of December every single year, and those have worked. Those have worked perfectly fine. It's the hardest part and the longest part is getting through all the language and all the criteria to set everything in place of what you need for the protection of the 20 years. And I'll tell you, Mike, that I during the early part of negotiations with Tom. One of the questions I asked him was, at the end of 20 years, who's responsible for the removal of this product? And right. as he answered you, so that, you know, all that is on our radar. I mean, anyone else that has stuff that, you know, they have questions and or concerns, then by all means, you know, send me an email and I'll add that to the to the list of what we need to be aware of. Mr. O'Leary, then we're going to try to wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, I know. It's like time. It, I, I think we should uh, give a, a favorable recommendation as far as, uh, you know, securing a spot on the warrant for the October Town meeting to enter into a pilot agreement with Nextera. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, between now and then, uh, I think we need to be made more aware as to what the actual financial deal is and what the real assessed value of this. But and again, while this benefits your entire system, you know, it's going to be housed here. It's being housed on your property. And again, at the end of 20 years, you can buy it for zero dollars probably because it's already been depreciated and off their books and assume it. And therefore, we don't get anything anyway. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, I think uh, we need to take a look at, you know, really what the what the value is other than intrinsically, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to ha housing it in North Reading, you know. Yeah. And, and I want to understand what the state's overall goal is here and how we... I mean, obviously, carbon put yeah. footprint and doing yeah. all, well, the, all the right things. So they're doing all the right things environmentally, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, that costs money and they're putting 
our tax dollars up for that too as far as uh, you know grant monies to to do that so well that's uh, what i'm getting at there's probably some grant money out there that well we, that, we that's tie into it and sure but i mean that's part of what rmld has applied well. for and has been successful at and then to their credit right. because again it saves the ratepayers which are all of us uh, but as far as where it's going to be physically be housed proposed it was in north reading you know what's truly uh, the, the value of of that to next era and us one thing that is specific to north reading is if in that disaster scenario and there's a hurricane and, and national grid goes down this system could benefit the local North Reading area, and it's not going to benefit Linfield. But that's what I'm getting at. That you say that's your you say it could, but we still will have infrastructure cost on our end to be able to seek that benefit. You got to transfer that power to us to those no, buildings. That, that's all part of this program. That's that's oh. very minimal. Okay. And and then, uh, how many other communities? To next year, you must have hundreds of other communities that you've entered into uh, similar agreements with. You know, municipal um, light companies um, and make pilot payments. Is, maybe you could assist us yeah. in assessing you sure. <laughs> sure. appropriately. Sure. 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 You know, yeah. it, uh, how has that done, or how has it been done in the past? And is there some sort of a, a very similar way? As, um, she was explaining. You know, but um, you must have hundreds of these across the nation, or thousands. Well, we or have, we have um, about 160 um, in, in process. Maybe megawatts operational. Um, we're right now the largest uh, operator of energy storage in the United States. But that doesn't say much because it's really a nascent industry. It's um, you know, probably three, three or five years. Last two to three years have been more active. The last year has been the most active in terms of development. And now it's really kind of um, becoming more mainstream, the federal Energy Regulatory Commission has issued orders to the ISOs and, and to and to the regional transmission operators and, of, and, and such to really facilitate this as more renewables. Um, a little bit back to some of the questions about why the state and the government is doing all this as renewables, because there's more renewables on the grid. The the balancing of load versus demand becomes more challenging. Because renewables, right, you're not, you, there's a lot of actually, we become quite precise at forecasting the wind and the sun in terms of what it's going to generate. But it's still not perfect. And, it, and you're still subject to it occurring, right, for the wind blowing or the sun shining. And that electricity needs to be consumed in the moment, but it doesn't mean that there's going to be an exact match with consumption. And so, the energy storage units act like a rubber band, a, a type of shock absorber between you know that load um, consumption and 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 the generation. Now coming from a generation you can't really control because it's it's going to be subject to to the natural conditions. And so that's where energy storage comes in. Big push by the federal government to get and and, and state governments to try to get more storage onto the grid to create that rubber band effect when it comes to energy. So yeah, have so you have you entered any, any agreements, or pilot agreements, with other communities that are structured a little bit differently, rather than straight line, and more performance based? I, I, I have to check on the details of that. I, I, I saw recently a pilot agreement with it was for a solar project. I have to check on the energy storage one. Yeah, I mean, if there are some that are, that are more structured based on performance, that might be something more interesting to look at. Yeah, I mean, the, the so what I like, you know, what I did. But I, but I like the idea. I like the excuse me. Yeah. I like the idea. I like the concept. I think I'm we should sorry, reserve some space on the October warrant. Uh, we get nine more items on the agenda tonight. It's already past uh, ten, so I don't mean to push it. But if there is a board member that's interested in this discussion, I would recommend that maybe you Deb, have them work with you, and you guys have these sure. meetings. Allow one of them to sit in, so they can sort of grab all this information, bring bring it back to us, so we don't, you know, a subject like this coming in here, it, it's too much and. Uh, and we need to probably, if someone's interested, if somebody has the time, I would encourage you to participate, sort of gather this information up so when we come back here next time, okay. it'll be a little yeah, easier. No, that's great. That's what we wanted to do tonight, was just start the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sold. I'll tell you. I'm not, yeah. But help me get there. Maybe somebody from the board can. Okay. Yeah, and I, right now it's vacant space 
that's not taxed, taxable. it's still a win. It's Ta now taxable. It's, 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 it's a win, but is it fair? And I think if we're going to be treated fairly, to, right. I think it needs to be that's probably evaluated. That's it's all about, yeah. Yeah. I think the concept's great. I just not think yep. we're being treated fair, but I'm not there yet. Okay. So we're going to move on. Thank enough. you for your time. All right. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, we got to go back to the special municipal employee disclosure form. Mr. Uh, Gilberto. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> this is a follow-up to the designation that we asked the board to consider uh, last year uh, and that we asked the board to review during the renewal time in December of last year. We had received an initial opinion that in order for an appointment to be made to the special municipal employee positions, uh, which are mostly our seasonal and other part-time positions in Parks and Recreation, uh, Elder Affairs, as well as another example of it. Um, what's coming up now is we have some folks who are looking for appointment to seasonal Parks and Recreation positions. Uh, we found out uh, in the course of our review that, in fact, uh, there is no further authorization required from the Board of Selectmen, that the designation alone is sufficient. Um, the individuals need to file a form um, with uh, with my office, <coughs> excuse me, as the appointing authority, but there's actually no further action required by the board, so my recommendation is we pass over this item. Yeah, actually, we would have to rescind what we already did, basically. In other uh, words, we, once we've created a special municipal employee status for that position, mm -hmm. they have it, or the position has it, yeah. unless until the board changes it. Correct. Right. And so we, we don't have to do it annually. What, what, what we were being told was that the individual appointments needed to also be approved by the board, oh, which yeah, is no. not, the, not the case. That's not the case. Yep. So I'm told by the Human Resources Director, at least. So it's not the case. So my recommendation is to pass over. Okay. Next item. Then. That's easy. Approve the June town meeting home rule petitions. Mr. Chairman, through you very quickly, uh, these are the two uh, home rule petitions that were approved at town meeting relative to the name, uh, excuse me, the title for this board, select board, as well as the scheduling of the, uh, t the date of the town meetings, both the June and October town meetings. Um, there was drafts of legislation that was in the meeting packet. We did have one change relative to the legislation concerning the town meeting dates, and that was to clarify that the two meetings one is a spring town meeting, one is a fall town meeting, which is a clarification. And uh, if the board is so inclined to vote to uh, approve uh, the motion that we've provided, we should be able to provide the legislation with the certified votes of the town meeting to Representative Jones as soon as tomorrow. I believe we've prepared a motion. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve and submit to the legislature the attached home rule petitions approved at the June 2018 annual town meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Just Mr. a Mr. question for Michael. <laughs> he wants to keep you in the dark on this one. <laughs> Good night. Do we have to advertise this before it goes to the legislature, Michael? Oh, like the other? Uh, not to my knowledge. Not it's a, it's a home, home Rule Act taking place, uh, so I'm not aware of any requirement. Any other questions? None heard. All those no, excuse me, just oh, my only comment is, you know, while I didn't support these an initial um, recommendations from the board, town meeting is voted and acted, I will be in support. Okay. Thank Same you. Mayor. Any other discussions? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. All right. Moving right along. The middle and high school driveway. Uh, Finally. Well, for you, no. we're getting there. It oh, did, it's another one of those. It's almost there. <laughs> it's almost there. It's been more than four years. This has been about seven years in the seven making. Has that been that long? It's been that long. Uh, Mr. Delaney, I think, was chairman. I was on the board anyway when yeah. we first started talking. I brought him over to the Gills House. Um, and how long has he been off now? Four years. Been a, four years. Five yeah. Years. So, so it's it's probably close to seven years anyway. Uh, so it, just by way. I'll, I'll make the motion, Mr. Right. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the order of taking for the parcel of land shown as parcel, quote, parcel A, area equal 127 square feet on a plan entitled, quote, acceptance of plan and street layout plan, middle high school driveway, North Reading, Massachusetts, with a revision date of December 24, 2015, prepared by Welch Associates, Land Surveyors Incorporated to sign the order of taking and to award damages in the amount of zero dollars. 
Second. We have a second. Discussion. Mr. Chairman, uh, as most of us are aware, but it's been a long time. Uh, in regard to the uh, middle school, high school project, uh, the parcel of land, uh, a small sliver of a parcel of land right at the entrance to the, um, to the driveway of the now street at the middle school, high school, was needed for utilities, uh, for traffic signalization and drainage, I believe, too. But uh, it belonged to uh, uh, Kevin Gill and his wife Susan. Uh, and in discussions with them way back when, uh, they were amenable to um, entering into discussions and agreements with the town to transfer this small portion, 127 square feet, uh, to the town in return for basically some frontage on the driveway and an access uh, to their property. That has all been effectuated. Uh, we've actually been using uh, their land for all these years, and uh, we have finally come to a negotiated agreement uh, through their attorneys and town council after a lot of back and forth. And if you recall, I don't know how many years ago at an October town meeting, we had authorized the uh, purchase of the land, uh, borrowing for the purposes of uh, anyway, you know, through appropriation, taxation, raise appropriate, and or by eminent domain taking. Uh, this would be a, a friendly taking whereby no damages would be awarded. Uh, they're in, all in favor of it. We're assuming the, uh, the legal cost of filing all the necessary paperwork. And uh, again, they've been extremely patient and worked very well uh, with us. And this hopefully brings it to some closure shortly. Anything else, sir? Mr. Gilberto. Just a summary of the terms. We, we said that the damages were zero dollars and we're not paying for the property, but the details of the deal are up on this Exhibit A here, which is effectively that the town uh, acquires 127 square feet at the corner of the Middle High School driveway and Park Street. Uh, the property owner at this address gains frontage for side access to their property on a public way known as Middle High School driveway, uh, as well as a paved apron connecting that public uh, way to their property, much in the same way that every driveway here in town has been uh, paved. That took place during the final paving of the access road, so it already exists. Uh, this really is uh, one of the last steps. Another step that needed to take place was the subdividing of the lot, which was approved earlier this evening by the Community Planning Commission. I have the Mylar plan here. It does require a signature from the Board of Selectmen as well as a street uh, layout plan, but we will need to go back to town meeting to expand the size of the middle high school driveway layout to include that triangular portion. Some of you may remember that we accepted that road, I want to say October of 2014, um, but we only accepted the straight portion. We didn't accept the portion that's being conveyed through this taking. Yeah, my recommendation is let's yeah. let's get it done. And I thank the Gills for working with us for this long and for their patience yes. and cooperation. Mrs. Minnie Pelly, you good? So in other words, I just want to because I wasn't here probably when this started. So in other words, they're they're giving us the land of right the here. Park right here. Yeah. And then they're allowed to access their lot. From there. On the side there. Right on the slide. We basically created an apron, a, a curb cut, and an apron for it. So, mm. how did they access their property before? Yeah, right off of Park Street. It's mm. a secondary yeah. area. So, yeah. right, right off of Park Street. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, through you. Yes. So, to, to I think answer the question, the property owner was accessing through the previous high school driveway which was not an accepted way so he was passing and repassing through the town uh, the school department's access basically um, in terms of guaranteeing him access there was some talk about giving him an easement uh -huh. over that driveway but the requirements for the town needing to be provided insurance given the nature of the operation just became too complicated yeah. in 2014 yeah. so the solution that was developed in 2014 was for the town to actually accept that portion of what was town owned land under the care custody and control of the school department as an accepted way so when you turn off of park street to go on to the middle high school driveway there's actually a street sign that calls it that and until and just about the uh, little slightly north of that side access to his property where you'll see there's a pretty large wood cutting yeah. pile um, is actually a public way. 
So he, he was given that frontage in 2014 before this all took place, and that was something that oh. we agreed to. It did not change the developability of his lot. It did not create any additional uh, rights that he doesn't have right now by virtue of the frontage he has on Park Street. Um, so um, I, I've driven up back and forth on that road. I never noticed a curb cut into someone's lane. You're going to start it's driving it's fast. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> did you no notice those flashing lights? No, they did a nice job. job. Oh, no, they, they actually, no, they actually did a nice job in the install. <laughs> so, so that's because there is not a curb cut. It's actually uh, Cape Cod Berm at that location, right. but the apron levels out at the top. So he does actually drive over this uh, inclined Cape Cod Berm. Okay. Uh, it's not granite, so it's not like it's you know, right. impassable. No. But the berm was required, otherwise it would not have been passable. And so the berm was installed okay. when we contracted with Gilbane to finish it's the project in 2060. It, it, it's hardly noticeable. Yeah, nice yeah. yeah. But yeah. fully acceptable by the gills. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. So, so they're fine. That's good. All right, no. so we have a motion, we have a second. Any more discussion? Just that you're yes. going to sign this later. That's correct. All right, so don't sign it tonight. I but the rest of us are going to be asked to sign it this evening. Okay. Just sign it in front of a notary. Right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Is that the same for the Mylar? Um, do we need no. a notary for that? No. Okay. No, we do not need a, not a notary uh, for the Mylar. Um, Board members, don't go home until you sign it. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to be asking you to sign before you leave. We did yeah. not prepare a vote for this because the street acceptance already took place. Um, but it's labeled a street acceptance plan, which is a bit puzzling to me, to be honest with you. It just didn't come in until this afternoon. Yeah. But I'm going to ask the board members to sign it if there's an issue. We'll deal with it later. Yeah, if we have to go back and re-vote it. Okay, next. Okay, so there's two copies. Yep. Um, while you guys are signing it, Michael, could you throw that presentation up there? China. The town administrative review. So, board members, as you know, this year um, under the open meeting law, we had to change our approach and how we generate the town administrator's annual report. So, I'm getting a little used to it, and I'm still not sure I'm in agreement with it. But the process, as you know, is that we have to submit to the HR director. He puts it all together. Then he provides it to me. I go over, I review it with the HR director, make any clerical changes, and then I present it to the town administrator. And then once he's in agreement with what you all put together and how we presented it, then I present it to you. So what I did is I built a summary for this evening, and then what I'll do is I'm going to email you the, the whole thing in totality. What I couldn't confirm was could I send it to you before tonight's meeting or after, and it sounds like I had to do it after this meeting. I'm hoping next year at this time it gets cleared up a little bit more than this. So I apologize if you see some confusion in it, in the length that it took, but I, I'm still, it's not, um, it's kind of jello to me right now. So I put these few slides together and could we, Mike, could you please, could you have the It's right, let's see. Oh, thank you. There we go. I got it. So, as you know, and for the public um, listening at home, and hopefully they can see this, so how it is that we, we have five, sorry, five categories, relationship with the board, financial management, community and public relations, personal administration, professional skills and abilities. So we have those five categories. What we do is each individual board member reviews it individually, they score it on the multiple questions. Some of them, each one of those categories, some have 10 questions, some have 12 or 13 questions, and they give a rating from one to five. One being the worst, five being the best. And how we do this, we take the highest possible total score divided by five, and that's how we came up with this particular number. So we'll start with the relationships with the board. And here's this out of possible 50 points the town administrator scored, he achieved 48.612. So pretty close to the max. In the comments, there were really no negative comments. There were no suggested uh, criticism, you know, or create, uh, excuse me, constructive, sorry, criticism. Criticism. constructive criticisms in there. I think the board pretty much was in full agreement that we really like the effort that you go through, the time you take 
to continue to build the relationship with us individually and commu to communicate with us individually and as well as a full board. So we feel that you know, clearly, Michael, you're doing an outstanding job in that area. What I have is at the very last slide is I put together a summary of every year that you've been here with us now, four years, to show the board sort of the trends in every one of these areas. So, but since you've been here, this has continued to been a very high score for you and, and it's even probably, this is probably the best score you've ever gotten. So it's ticked up every year a little bit, if I recall. So I have nothing else to add on that one. Financial management, out of a possible 40 points, you achieved 38.412. Again, pretty close to the max. Continued positive comments. I think the board uh, comments were really revolved around how over the last several years you and your finance director have put together a great strategy on building the budgets, uh, how you worked with the finance planning team, how you've integrated FinCom into it, and the communication of it all. And I think you see that in our budgets and our effectiveness to get the budgets approved. And so the, the scoring justifies uh, the results. Community and public relations out of a possible 40 points, the town administrator achieved 39.608. Again, pretty much to the max. And we have seen a big difference since the time you arrived. We think the communication not only with us here in these meetings and individually, privately, but even the public has seen it. They've seen you in the, in the community. They've seen you active in the community. And I think that goes a long way. And we've made, you've made a, a strong effort, not only for yourself, but also having your department heads to use the website, to use social media, to try to find p ways to communicate better with the public, and to also give the impression of openness. People can call. People come in and stop in and see you. And so the feedback has been great. And this score reflects that. Personal administration. Out of a possible 50 points, the town administrator achieved a score of 46.87. Since you've been here, it hasn't been easy when it comes to personnel administration. You've had some challenges, not because of your doing, but just sort of there's been a lot of turnover. But at the key points that if you read in the final results is you've been great in your, re in your hirings. You've been outstanding in ability to recruit, your ability to find the right person in the, in the top candidate in every one of those hires going forward and your ability to retain. You know, and that's, that's very important and this score reflects that. Professional skills and abilities out of a possible 50 points, town administrator achieved a score of 49.008. Again, pretty much close to the max. So folks listening at home, how this, the whole scoring works, the, the rating works this way. Anything between 51 and 95 needs improvement. 96 to 140, satisfactory. 141 to 185, commendable. And then 186 to 230, max is 230. Town Administrator achieved 222.51, essentially, seven points away from maxing out so it's an outstanding and you've earned it and your family has sacrificed for you to earn that we know that it reflects what the time and the effort that you put in to us in for this town every year um, you should be very proud of yourself so what it is I put this last slide together that's just to give the board members and the folks listening at home to show you the trends this town administrator how valuable he is to our full operations and I'm not going to read it all but you can visually see that and then we can make this available uh, anybody that wants to see it but as you can see in the first category in the relationships with the board you know right from the day you showed up it was pretty good you did a great job but you can see it trended upward every year for the last four years so you're on the right path and I know you will continue to keep that at a high level and the same thing with your fiscal management. You started out around 34, and now you're over 38. 
that's a big improvement. That's a big swing when you read all the questions that are in there. And um, there are some, some challenging goals and objectives that you have to achieve to be able to get the score, and you and your team have done that. In the community and com public relations, you know, you've gone up over two points in four years, and that's a good swing, and we've got to continue to keep working on that. Personnel administration, we've gone up quite a bit, from 39 to almost 47. Very big swing, and we, we felt the results of that by just looking of the folks that sit right here in this building that you've hired, that you brought onto your team, and also in our public safety buildings and our police and fire, in our library, in our senior center, all the changes you've made, all been positive, and, we, and we're all reaping the benefit of those. And then your professional skills and abilities, you know, they were pretty high when you showed up. We knew that. That's why we hired you. But it started out with a 42 your first year, and you're over, you're almost you know, just over 49. So you should be commended for it, Michael. You should be proud of yourself for these. You should go home and put this on the refrigerator and show your children. <laughs> and you're a good role model, and you're a good role model for our town. You represent, represent us well, and I'm proud to have you here with us. And I hope you, uh, you, you appreciate this feedback, because we all spent a, um, a lot of time looking at it. And I'm sure the board members want to take an opportunity now to share their thoughts and, and ask any questions as well. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I, Mike, you're a tremendous asset to the town, and we're lucky to have you. That's can't say anything more than that. I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. Thank you. Mrs. Mignopelli. Same, and um, also, I what I appreciate is not just that you are linking us into what's going on, but when <coughs> there are issues of personnel administration, you're respectful of the employees and you always come from a position of, you know, reminding us, you know, of the person that's involved. It, it does involve someone personally. It's a person and a person's family that's involved. So I like that. And I agree. I, I thank your family because there's a lot that people don't see that you do here. And even we don't know all that you do here in, in staying late hours, attending a lot of meetings, just to make sure that you know what's going on and, and can come back to us and let us know what's going on with all the different boards and commissions. We could never make it to everything. It's impossible. I'm not sure how you do, but I do know you have a family behind you that lets you do that. So I appreciate your whole family for for letting us have you for that whole entire uh, amount of time and I just think you know I'm not I'm not sure why you didn't get perfect scores but <laughs> that's okay we have to let you have room to grow here but but um yeah I think everything I, I appreciate the communication that you the feedback you're constantly keeping us aware even of just emergencies going on in the community we're always if we don't get a text from you right away or we're asking you about something we get a response immediately doesn't matter when or what time or anything like that so good good overall you're uh, you're uh, I didn't know anyone prior because I started around the same time as you but I know you're a lucky find for the community we should try to keep you here. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Masseri. <coughs> uh, serving as chair for three of the four years that you've been here uh, and meeting with you on a weekly basis and being able to uh, discuss the issues and find that you are open-minded not only to the chairman but to the entire board manage to keep everybody informed in one form or another and have been very helpful in making improvements in where we meet, how we communicate, and uh, you know, I think that the town uh, has, has certainly had some challenges over the past few years and has grown a lot. And uh, you have uh, shown that not only that you have helped all of that happen, but you're well prepared to continue 
with the town's growth and the challenges that still lie before us. And I want to thank you personally. Thank you for all of that. Mr. O'Leary. We're very fortunate to have you, first and foremost. Um, secondarily, I've had the uh, opportunity to serve with lots of town administrators, uh, several over the years, and, uh, and so this in comparing and contrasting and uh, looking at the issues that we've faced over the years and how we've met those challenges and the challenges we have today, uh, you by far have uh, smoothed the path for us uh, as well and better than, than most everybody we've had prior to. And I think it's uh, indicative of your, your skill sets in relation to uh, your ability to communicate, communicate clearly, communicate with all of us, treat us all the same, you know, as far as the board members. So the relationship with the board is, has been exceptional, you know, and uh, that hasn't always been the case. I mean, uh, some of the criticism of others in the past, you know, some justified, some unjustified, but th there's, there's no reason to criticize you at all in that particular area. You know, the fiscal management, I mean, the challenges that have faced us, um, over the last four or five years, significant, uh, and I think one of the biggest things, and it plays into all these categories, is is your credibility. People have found over the last four years, uh, you know, when you get up to speak, whether it be in a public meeting or whether it be in one of our meetings and the people that are watching and paying attention, um, there is a, a sense of credibility that you bring to the table, which is it, so important, so important for us, you know, as, as leaders to try and uh, set some policy and for you to try as an administrator to try and, uh, you know, carry those policies out. So the credibility is, is, is critical and, and I think you've, you've been managing that extremely well and, uh, you know, you make us look good and that's not an easy task, you know, <laughs> <laughs> truly, it you know, and, it's true. and I think over the last couple of years, uh, even the relationship among the board members has, has improved and you have played a strong role in making that happen, and that's important. And uh, you've been able to uh, bridge some divides and uh, do it very effectively. I think you have good political instincts, which are critical at times. Again, you're not every decision is economics and fiscal. Uh, it, it, some of this, this is some political decisions, and you leave those decisions to the boards appropriately, but you also lend some guidance to us in, in helping us formulate those, uh, those decisions. So, you know, congratulations on your, uh, on your outstanding overall performance and, uh, and I know you know just in some of the roles that I have you know being on the secondary school building committee negotiating this deal with Andover you know the, the time that you spend and um, the energy that's expended uh, and the hours and hours and hours and days and weeks and weekends uh, that are spent that people don't see and don't necessarily appreciate uh, we certainly do uh, appreciate it and recognize it so uh, you don't have an easy job, but no. you're making it look easy. So uh, congratulations for that, and congratulations on your overall rating. You've, you've certainly deserved it. Thank you've you. earned it. Thank you. I just have two more things to add, and we'll wrap this up. So just on this last slide, I just want to point out that, you know, the first year was a different board, slightly different. We had one different member. So you've been reviewed by six different board members at times over the last four years. And I think that's important to know because you – You'll be able to continue to show the same trends of positive, even though the board's changed slightly over those years, and and that's wonderful. And hopefully, going forward, if the board changes again, I have no doubt in my mind that will continue going forward. And then the last thing I just want to share with the board, and it kind of touches upon what Mr. O'Leary was saying at the end of his comments, we we do all recognize the hours that you put. And I did mention your family earlier, and I mean it. They sacrificed, Michael. And Michael and I, when we sat down one-on-one, -on -one, that was the one thing at the end, my constructive criticism at all, is that he needs to learn how to say no. He goes to a lot of meetings that we don't see and that you don't know about. And I asked him a question. You know, how many meetings last year would you, you, did you walk away saying, I think that was a waste of my time. And it was, I thought it was going to be at least a couple dozen, and it, it was probably more than that. And I only say this tonight, Mike, because I want everyone to hear me say it. And if the board members want to object to it, they can. But you need to be you need to be selfish about your time. You need to learn to focus in on the most valuable use of your time. And you need to make time for your family as well. And I had suggested to the town administrator to pick one day a week where he tries to block his schedule to get out of work at a you know, a somewhat normal hour and just focus on family. Because 
you know, Mr. Missouri, Mr. Larry, you guys went along with them as well with the whole water thing. You guys gave up plenty of time, and and that's impacting, and we know that. And for you to continue to be an effective leader, you also need to have time to breathe, and to do you know to sort of recharge your batteries, and to continue to stay at that thousand foot level, helping us lead this town forward. And um, so I hopefully those are the only constructive criticisms I had. In the review and the final pages that I will send out to the board, there were some of the board members made some recommendations for future goals, and I think they were excellent inputs, every one of them. I didn't particularly make any, um, but I thought the board members did a great job of your inputs. I think there's some valuable information in there um, to, you know, as you structure your goals for next year. And we go into strategic planning as well. I think a lot of the inputs uh, will do us all valuable. And as a board, I, I want to thank you. And I know I'm not perfect. And um, there's always area of improvement for me. Uh, I've tried to evolve in the years I've been here. But I think we have worked very effectively. We're not in agreement all the time, which is not necessarily a bad thing. So as we review the town administrator, we review ourselves. And I think the feedback is that we should continue to try to have a respectful um, communication, exchange, um, respect each other's feelings to, and, and to try to just work together. We don't always have to agree, but we should always try our best, and including myself, try to always be a lot better at respecting your opinions, but always trying to make decisions in the best interest of our community. And, uh, so I thank you all for your time putting into this. And again, once again, I do apologize that the process seemed a little ja jaded. It'll get better than that. Not your fault. <laughs> well, it falls we, on we me. Got, we, no, we got some advice late. Mm -hmm. so. that, uh, late breaking th That we, uh, you know, oh. needed to follow, I guess. But yes. I don't disagree with you. I didn't like the, I don't necessarily agree with it. But <laughs> So I'd like to turn over you to say a couple of things. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So first, just to the board, thank you very much for your comments. I, I really appreciate uh, your feedback and the review, your comments this evening. Um, you know, I, I, as I say, I, I know I say it every year, but, I, you know, my, my belief is this is the area where we are evaluating a lot of different things, and it, I think it's focused on my performance, but really it's an evaluation of how we're doing overall, and some of you have touched on that in your, in your comments. So um, I just want to take a, a couple moments to recognize some of the people who are not in the room this evening but are, are, are part of the, the success. And uh, we've talked a lot recently, but I'm going to say it again. Our state delegation, I mean, we've been able to accomplish a lot all of us and, and we have great state house leadership and representative jones and, and senator tar um, our employees who are dedicated day in and day out and it runs the gamut from the longest tenured public safety or public works personnel the professional administrative staff here in the town hall the staff in our human services over the library and the senior center and uh, even our per diem staff working elections or otherwise i mean we're just blessed with great staff who who make our town run and uh, and serve our residents day in and day out, and I, I just I need to recognize and and, and thank them for their efforts. Uh, our department heads, uh, we have tremendous professionals uh, here that we see in our budget hearings, and you know when issues come up in between then, but day in and day out they're running their departments and trying to find the best use of the taxpayers' dollar, trying to address the needs and trying to look ahead for how to address things, um, and and that. The connection between us and them is often through uh, Jane and Karen. So Jane and Karen, I, I need to thank Karen's not here this evening, obviously. But Jane, thank you so much for everything that you do to, to keep things running. And to Karen, who's uh, not here but uh, uh, is, a, is so, so critical, I think, as we all know, to keeping everything moving um, here in the town hall. Um, we're just blessed with great staff. And just uh, you know, a couple of personal notes. Uh, I just you know, want to recognize my parents. You know, they, they had quite, quite a bit of sacrifice for their children over the years, and now they continue to, to help out today in caring for my children, um, which is important given the demands of the position. Um, and a special thank you to my mother-in-law, who is visiting from out of state right now, actually happens to be up here, and has made herself available to help us out during uh, some of the busier times when we need an extra set of hands. Uh, my boys, Noah, Max, and Luke, uh, for their patience and understanding. Um, there's no four or six-year-old out there who better understands the, mean, the meaning of the words, I have a meeting. <laughs> then Noah and Max, and hopefully Luke is listening. <laughs> uh, and then finally, my, uh, my amazing wife, uh, Jen. Um, when I have a meeting or I'm called away unexpectedly at night or on the weekend, uh, the responsibilities at home all fall to her. 
and um, it, it seems to us, I'm sure, uh, that it, it's always been this way because of the, the uh, career path I've chosen. Um, and we really haven't known anything any different for quite some time, but it doesn't change the fact that uh, she is amazing. So I just want to say thank you to her. So again, thank you. We thank her as well. Okay. We're done, we're done embarrassing you now. <laughs> thank you. After Kenny Field, restroom concession stands. Go to approve payment. Mr. Chairman, through you, these are, uh, there are two payment requisitions that are pending. Um, requisition number eight and nine, uh, which from my estimation would conclude the payments owed to the contractor. Um, in looking at this, we have a couple of open, uh, open items uh, relative to paving. And so my, um, my recommendation to the board and, um, is to approve payment requisition number eight, uh, but withhold action on payment requisition number nine while we try to resolve those issues. I don't want to give the impression that uh, anybody is being disagreeable to resolving these issues because right now we don't have any indication that that's the case. But uh, you know, certainly we're not at a at a point yet where we feel the work is 100% complete, um, and so I would recommend approval of requisition number eight, uh, but withholding action on requisition number nine. And I believe there's a motion accordingly. Yes, Mr. O'Leary, I'll take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve payment to Construction Dynamics Incorporated in the amount of $81,953.16, as is reflected in payment requisition number eight. Second. The motion is second. Any more discussion? You, Mr. O'Leary. I concur with the town administrator's recommendation. One, one, more, one more thing. We're, we're getting close. To finishing this one up too, yeah. I mean, everything's just almost there. And this is another one. And again, uh, it, it's a it's a project we can be proud of. Uh, again, it's the world's most expensive bathrooms, but nonetheless, the facilities are being utilized on a regular basis right now and are functioning very well, uh, along with the the snack shack. And it really does, uh, as Mr. Webster pointed out, a town meeting does complete the uh, the complex uh, down there. So just as we uh, try and finalize uh, some finishing touches down on the project, uh, I think it's in the town's best interest just to withhold this payment for a short period of time to resolve it. The well, issues. We put it to the test right out of the gate with two sure state did. meets, mm -hmm. and I haven't heard one complaint. No. And they said there was wonderful, especially the women I spoke to really appreciate uh, being able to go into a real restaurant, and uh, it's wonderful. And when you drive by, it looks like it's been there since the day you guys built yeah, the school. And the other thing is, uh, other comments uh, I heard from uh, the school department and Marty Tilton is that those uh, people that are actually utilizing the facility at that particular point in time have been very respectful and uh, using the snack shack, great shape. People have left it the way they found it, and that's uh, encouraging and helpful and uh, will go a long way to its uh, usage for a long period of time. So we hope that uh, level of activity increases, and we hope that the level of respect for the facility is, is maintained so it's a great thing okay any other comments none heard all those in favor aye, aye. opposed unanimous okay liaison assignments so I sent an email out. I apologize I was a little late getting that out to everyone I didn't make a lot of changes I hope everyone received it I didn't get any uh, responses from anyone but uh, again we don't have to make any final decisions this evening but I did make some slight changes Michael, is it in the packet or? Uh, it's not in the meeting packet for this evening, although I can, at a minimum, you upload it to drop You had emailed it out, Michael. I did. I, yeah. I thought I'd, I probably screwed up and forgot to ask to have it put in it. But I believe I made a change on the wa wastewater. It's up to you, Steve and Bob. I know you guys put so much time in up till now. If you just feel you need a break, we can certainly make those changes. But you had the momentum. You got the relationships. I take myself off wastewater. Place Mr. O'Leary on it. Thought it made sense based on the the track and the path we're on. Um, and I think I put myself on capital because I realized when I was going through the liaison, I've never been on capital. It's Almost good. nine years on the board, I've never been on capital. It's a good. Uh, it's, yeah. a so, good it's a good. Um, it's a good exercise. I'm looking yeah. forward to to doing it. And I, um, out of respect to time, when I started looking at the liaison assignments, um, Mr. Masseri and Mr. O'Leary. And everybody, I mean, but your, your load is pretty heavy. So I left Mr. Schultz on the CIP for one more year to give Mrs. Mignapelli a little bit of a break because uh, I know that was somewhat of a challenge for you, I believe, right, with some of the 
other things that you have going on. So I put myself and Mr. Schultz, but if somebody else wants, or Andy, it's too much for you. No, it was a good, very good group. Yep. Okay. They do meet on the early side a little bit. So but I figured uh, you've been there. Yeah, yeah, you can guide me along. And I think that's the only changes I made. I, I don't think I made anything else. I highlight it in yellow. So if no one has any objections, I'd like to tell Karen to uh, post it. Go forward with it. Okay? Okay. Okay with me. Sounds good. All right. Next, um, appointments, three appointments, Capital Improvement Committee. I think we have a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to recommend the following individuals for reappointment to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee for terms to expire June 30th, 2021. Donald Kelleher, Finance Committee Representative, Joseph Fodi. Second. I have a motion and a second by Ms. Minupelli. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. All right, and let's see. Mr. Chairman, I move to appoint. It will be yourself. Michael Prisco as a member of the Capital Improvement Planning Committee for a term through, what, what are we doing? It just, um, do so we do it through the election? I think you got to do it to at least the end of my term. Yeah, mm -hmm. to your term. Which is? May 2019. Yeah. Right. So right, is that how you ask this, Andy? Uh, should we, should we report? I don't know if that was a year, I'm not I sure how long I just got was. reappointed. That makes sense. But okay, May so 2019. Yep. Makes sense. So Andy, you must already be appointed for next year. I don't know. Right? He's not on there. Yeah, it, the appointment yeah. is three-year term. term. So you should have been okay. appointed three-year term. Good. Good. Okay. Um, so what about a have second? Have you, I need a I need second. A second. Okay. Mr. Schultz will second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah, no. Legal bills. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because of the election. Yeah. yeah. Any legal bills? There should be a motion in there for legal Mr. bills. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for April 2018 in the amount of $5,826.04 as follows. Copeland and Page General, $3,942.54. Copeland and Page PC Labor, $171. Coppola and Coppola, uh, $1,712.50. Total $5,826.04. I have, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? Mr. O Ms. Airy. Michael, I take it that uh, none of the uh, legal or Andover's in that bill, right? If it is, they sold themselves short. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it wouldn't be. Yeah, this is there, through there, April. There wouldn't be. Uh, there be first, some, maybe. There may have been bit. some of the uh, an initial meeting with Mr. Corbo in early right. April in there, but the meat of the work the was meat is not there. May. It's too small a bill, Michael. Uh, and we would <laughs> intend to book those costs against the uh, water appropriation for legal yeah. counsel. I think it's eight thousand dollars. Okay. That we have appropriated. Really? It may exceed that. I don't know. <laughs> Any other comments? Questions? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. And now we're down to town administrator's report. Just a few items I'd like to report on, Mr. Chairman, um, and I'll just touch on them briefly because of the late hour. Uh, we're intending to distribute the town-owned land memorandum uh, this week, and I put a copy of the draft in the, uh, in the packet uh, for today's meeting. Uh, on June 11th, last Monday, I participated in the school committee's vote on a collective bargaining agreement with the North Reading Education Association. Uh, I voted in favor of the agreement and offered uh, comments, which I attached to the report. And I just want to note uh, the effort of the bargaining team, uh, former school committee member Jerry Venezia and current school committee member Mel Webster, uh, for their efforts to negotiate the agreement. Um, I'm told by Town Clerk Barbara Stats that Representative Brad Jones was to receive the Mass Town Clerks Association Legislator of the Year Award on June 14th in recognition of his ongoing efforts and subsequent reimbursement to all communities in the Commonwealth for expenses relative to the early voting period in the November 2016 election. So congratulations to Representative Jones. 
<laughs> Construction of the Havel Street sidewalk continues, as is indicated in the report from the town engineer. Uh, binder paving occurred last week, and final paving is scheduled to occur this week, I believe starting uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, as you know, the project was funded by a $368,000 Complete Streets grant program. While the overall project is expected to be under budget by about $30,000, there's a portion relative to police detail costs that are not eligible for the grant. Um, pleased to report that working with Representative Jones and his staff on Friday and then again today, we we're able to get a commitment from the state to adjust the percentages allowed to cover that cost, so which means that uh, uh, we won't that the town won't be responsible for any out-of-pocket costs on the town's end uh, we would have would have worked to find a funding source for that if need be but we got some good news late this afternoon that the state's gonna uh, waive our, uh, a limitation for the project the project was a bit of a challenge I mean I think most members know the reason that the sidewalk was to be constructed in that spot was not only because there is no sidewalk but because it's a very windy section of Havel Street I think we were hopeful we could get away with uh, limited police details, but for public safety, really couldn't just because of the, the twists and turns in, in a couple of locations there. So, I want to thank again Representative Jones and his staff for their help to try to get that taken care of for us. And that concludes my comments for this evening. Thank you. That brings us to old and new business. Is there any, Mr. O'Leary? I, I just want to uh, comment on the Haverhill Street sidewalk project. And I grew up in Haverhill Street. Uh, it, fantastic. I, mean, I was surprised it could even fit, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. I was shocked. And, and they, <laughs> they've done a great job, and it, it really is a tremendous uh, uh, addition for the community from a public safety yeah. and a pedestrian standpoint. It's a huge improvement. And at that point, you know, you're basically going from the end of a line all the way down to the center of town. Yeah. Finally, uh, that gap has been been filled. But they did a terrific job. It looks great. You did so, a great job. The yeah. curb, curb looks beautiful. Yeah, it's got granite curb. Which, which, think it's which been looks there great. forever. And, uh, and again, kudos to uh, Representative Jones. Uh, he's doing a great job for us. Mr. Messier. Uh, having travel on Havel Street every morning, uh, the police detail did a great job, too. They did. That there was a challenge. Was never back up, and there were a few blind spots on that road over the where the corners are. Mm -hmm. And there was a time I was thinking, that nobody was doing anything there, and yet every time I came home, there was progress. You know, it was almost maybe I got going a little too early in the morning, and I don't know. A uh, second thing, and probably mo even more important, is now that we've uh, passed the water and we've got Andover's attention, I think we need to get turn the heat up now on the uh, sewer, and uh, it's going to take some engineering work to kind of lay out. Uh, you know, there's some crude estimates that have been put together, but I think we need to start to think about two things. One is to get some engineering uh, work done to come up with the cost, and two is how we're going to finance this. What portion is the town going to cover, and then what portion will fit into the betterment uh, progress for those that are going to be utilizing the sewer. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think that maybe we ought to do a little, uh, have a little discussion on this, and maybe uh, this we might want to think about what we mo might want to do at October town meeting. Okay. Okay. We'll run it. And um, one of <laughs> you just a, it. yeah, I one know. little. Um, <laughs> and there's a third part to that, Bob, um, is the outreach. And oh, the, I'm sorry. The outreach. The outreach. outreach, yeah. And the right. EDC is meeting tomorrow evening, and it is on the agenda for them to discuss. And I think it, rightfully so, should they should take the the role in reaching out to the business community as there's information available, and hold workshops and make sure mm -hmm. that we feed the right information to them, and allow them to have the opportunity to sit with the business owners or the property owners along route. Uh, yeah, and we can utilize the chamber for some of that to get. Uh, yep business people so we're working on we're trying to build a plan tomorrow night to execute that when the time is right okay great um, because I think I think reach out is a big part of it as well uh, miss anything else mr. Masseri you're all no. set and mr. Schultz a couple quick items I met with the business community in the chamber uh, last week to discuss snow and ice so we're still moving forward we're trying to formulate a plan for the fall town meeting and also Wednesday night at IRP the return of the farmers market I want to give a Thanks to uh, Ken Tarr, who's done a ton of work on this. And uh, I know it's a labor of love for him. And uh, we're going to have it back this year. So come on down to IRP. Uh, it's Wednesday night, kind of after work hours. Nice. Yep. My daughter and her band are going to be singing down there one night. So. Are they? 
Yes, you guys will have to. I will make sure everyone's aware. All of our lighters. Anything else? Good. Good. So just a couple things. Um, August 7th, National Night Out. I believe that's the date. Also the date, you, Kate, I ask a favor if you could cover for me. Um, the federal partners are coming in to do the audit on Amy's grant. And so I am going to be away. So, Kate, if you could cover the meeting. And they're doing it the same night of the National Night Out so they can participate in that as well. So I'm not sure in times or when it is, but it's going to be that day. And I will get that information from you. Mike, are you aware of that audit as well? Uh, yeah, I've seen the emails. Thank you. So if you could communicate with Kate mm -hmm. and make sure she attends in my place. Sure. Um, and then, again, just the tobacco bylaw public hearing on July 30th, 7 p.m. in this room. And Mr. Mr. O'Leary, do you know, is Tees have it now fully open for the season, or is it still? Because some people went this weekend. It wasn't open. And it was scheduled to open June 15th. Uh, June it was not open up until June 15th. So that was the scheduled opening date. I didn't get a chance to go by. Uh, but it's but still planned to open, it's right? It's planned to open, normal okay. hours. It was supposed to be from the fifth last weekend on. Because I, a lot of people thought it would have been open by now, and I've got a lot of questions why. There have been a lot of questions. Really, the, the Hillview Commission has been a bit concerned uh, that they haven't been opened. Uh, the contract generally called for it to be open around April 1st. Yes. Um, but uh, Mr. Yeba had some uh, uh, issues with getting qualified help uh, and it asked for some sort of uh, relief and understanding in getting that done. And there's been communication between uh, the Commission, Mr. Yeber, myself as liaison, town administrator, and the commitment was uh, to have it open by June 15th, and I saw signs in the window to that effect. Good. I was not able to get by this weekend to see if it actually opened or not. But it is uh, definitely having an impact um, on, uh, you know, some of the play because obviously, you know, guys like to have smaller outings, you know, for some eight people, you know, go in and have a bite to eat someplace and, and a cold drink, and that hasn't been available. So the pro has been getting some complaints in relation to. Uh, some of the regular plays, you know, when is it going to open? Because, you know, people like to just go and golf and stay on the campus for uh, for the full time period that hasn't been available. So uh, they will, uh, the commission will be having, entering into discussions with uh, Mr. Yeba in the fall to determine, you know, how to proceed going forward. Thank you. And if you could just pass along to the commission that um, the feedback I've been getting this year is the co golf course is great. People are loving it. I think the uh, investment you all made in the uh, infrastructure for a new irrigation system is really paying it's off. It's paying off, yeah. Um, and so the feedback has been really, really good. I'll pass and it along. So I just last couple things I want to, again, thank you all, the entire board. We're sticking together on this water deal. I know there were some um, concerns on many of us right till the end, and um, but I, I think it's a wonderful thing we did for the town. I think it's good for us. I think it's good for the next people that sit in these seats. It's one less big deal that they have to worry about. Uh, and I look forward to building a, a, a greater relationship with Andover and as they guide us and help us through the sewage deal. Um, so with that said, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll give you a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.